we've been debating uh, since the beginning of the modern UFO era what the impact of uh, realization that we're being visited might have on society. Uh, speculation and, and studies have been done about uh, whether our social institutions would collapse, would disintegrate in the face of what presumably would be a much more advanced race of people. And uh, a lot of folks think that we're not ready to understand that kind of thing. Well, I think the viewers, the listeners of this program are certainly ready for it because this is something you've been interested in. You've all been studying it and listen, and hearing about it and debating it for a lot of years. It was only a little bit later that uh, that I, I learned about the flying saucer story, about the possibility that ET technology was being stored and tested out at Area 51, yeah, actually more specifically a place called S4. And the reason I heard about it is the guy who's going to be coming on in a couple of minutes, John Lear. Uh, John has, uh, has a distinguished career as a pilot. Uh, he's flown missions all over the world for the CIA. His father is the inventor of not only the Lear jet, but the eight track tape system, which was mighty fine technology back in its day. Just a moment from now, we're going to be talking with John Lear and you should buckle up your seats because you don't want to miss it. I'm back in a moment with Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. I'm George Knapp. Let's get right to it. John Lear, um, is a retired airline captain, a former CIA pilot, as well as the son of the uh, famous inventor of the Learjet. He's flown over 150 test aircraft. He's won every award granted by the FAA. He holds 18 world speed records and has worked for 28 different aircraft corporations. But back during the 1980s, his life sort of took a, a different kind of a twist when he started looking into the UFO mystery and issued uh, a manifesto that today uh, remains controversial. John, great to hear you. Great to talk to you. Good evening, George, and good evening to all my friends at AboveTopSecret.com, the three amigos, Mark, Bill, and Simon. And just a reminder that all the stuff I'm talking about with George uh, can be found on AboveTopSecret.com. Well, glad you got that plug out of the way, John. Let's let's go back to uh, let's go back to the beginning. At least for me, 1987 is 20 years ago. The first time I, I met and talked to you. Uh, you came into the TV station, and you already had some credibility with my news managers because of some other stories you'd worked on with them that were that became national, international stories. Um, you tried to talk my my mentor and friend, the late Ned Day, into taking a look at a stack of UFO documents. Ned wanted nothing to do with them, but I was eavesdropping, and I said, "Hey, let me take a look at that stuff," and I was just flabbergasted by what I read. Uh, I think uh, it included the MJ12 documents as well as some some uh, uh, documents that have been squeezed out of the government through the FOIA process that you provided me. And uh, so I had you on a little show I had back then called On the Record, one of those shows that airs at 4 o'clock in the morning and, and nobody watches, and the mayor would come on or a city councilman and talk about things that nobody cared about, and, and you come on and start talking about flying saucers. And my phone was ringing off the hook. I had you on again a second time, and, and uh, the response was even bigger and I realized that whatever you were you were saying touched the pulse of the public in a way that I had no appreciation for previously. So that's how I got started in in uh, looking into UFOs. I'm not sure if I should thank you or blame you for that. <laughs> that's exactly the way it happened. And I remember I was very good friends with Ned. He helped me expose a couple of frauds that were going on uh, in Las Vegas, uh, one with the police department. And uh, he was really a good guy, really informed. And if you remember, I was the one that tipped him off to the uh, stealth fighter. I think it was in the early 80s before anybody knew about it. And he was writing for uh, the Valley Times, Bob Brown. And uh, when he wrote the story, uh, he he misunderstood what I said and, and said it was a stealth fire. F-I-R-E instead of stealth fighter. Anyway, uh, we both almost went to jail over that one. But I do remember that day clearly when I was in there trying to tell Ned about what was going on at Area 51. And I remember what he said to me. He said, John, it's not possible. I would have known about it. And that's when you came up and said, I'd like to take a look at your stuff. Well, I sure am glad for that because back in those days you were very gracious to help a, a rookie investigator look into this stuff, providing me time and expertise and a lot of doc access to your files, voluminous files, and, and really gave me a good underpinning and understand, uh, at least get started uh, on this mystery. You know, I was kind of cocky about the whole thing back then, John, thinking, well, look, 
this what this mystery needs is a good investigative reporter. Give me six months, I'll have this wrapped up. <laughs> and of course, of course, that was twenty years ago. Or Certainly not any closer to it. You had uh, had an interest in Area 51 long before the rest of the world had, had heard heard about the place. I think something in the late 70s with Bob Stodall, another Las Vegas newsman, right? Yeah, back in 1963, when I was uh, working uh, as a flight instructor in Hawthorne, uh, I found out about the SR-71, and the guy who told me about it talked about a secret um place up in Nevada, and it took me like four or five years to find out exactly where it was. First of all, I thought it was up at Tonopah, and then uh, I came up here to work for a little while in Las Vegas, and uh, one of the pilots that used to fly up there like in 1967, 1967, 1968, says, no, no, the place is called Groom Lake. So I looked at, at that on a map, and uh, by gosh, that's, you know, that's where it turned out to be. So... <clears throat> Then I moved up to Las, uh, out to Las Vegas flying for an airline, and Bob Stoldow ran a story uh, for Channel 8, and the story was um, security leak at Groom Lake. So I called him up, and I said, Bob, I've never heard anybody mention Groom Lake on television. Uh, are you supposed to do that? And he said, well, you know, it, it's there, and, and we do have a story on it. So I said, well, let's have lunch. So I went down to have lunch with uh, Bob, and, and we met at the flame. Remember the flame, right? Oh, yeah, sure. So uh, And then we started talking, and he says, well, it doesn't make any difference anyway because it's going to be exposed next in a few weeks. API or AP and UPI are going in on foot. And I thought, oh, shoot, that, that that's great, but I wanted to be first. So I grabbed a couple of my airline buddies, and we drove out there about 5 o'clock in the morning, and I think it was like a weekday morning, and that was before the um, the uh, guard gate was there. And we drove over to the other side, and I took a bunch of pictures. And we got there like about seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, the lake bed was wet. It, I think it was in the winter. Or it just rained, and um, we got a bunch of pictures. And that one picture, they happened to have one of the MIGs out in front of the hangars. And that that uh, that particular picture is on the uh, special projects website. It's uh, that blows your mind, doesn't it? That you were able to get that close to the base and take photos, and nobody hassled you. You didn't get arrested. I mean, that would be impossible now. Yeah, it would be impossible now. Uh, you know, about <clears throat> ten minutes later, uh, we saw a, a, a cloud of dust as a guy was driving around. So it was kind of funny because I had my old um, Mark IV uh, seventy three uh, Lincoln black. And a couple airline guys, we were just standing there, and I had the the camera on a tripod. So uh, what happened is this guard was letting uh, a pickup truck out. So all there was was a little chain, uh, a chain link, or just a chain across the road. And he let the chain down, let the guy go through, and he's and he's he's putting the chain back up. He turns around, and there we are. We're not like ten feet away, and he didn't notice us. <laughs> and he said what are you guys doing here? And we said, we're not supposed to be here. And he says, hell no, you're not supposed to be here. And so he says, you wait right there. So he goes back to the truck and he gets a radio and he calls somebody and he comes back and uh, starts talking to us. He says, you wait right here. They're coming out to, uh, to check on you. And while we were waiting for the other guys to come out, we told him, you know, I told him, look, I grew up in uh, Van Nuys, California. I used to see the Lockheed Three Constellations uh, take off every Monday morning, come back every Friday afternoon. Many of my friends flew the SR-71. Uh, you know, I hang out at the pilot's table at, uh, uh, at, the, um, uh, at the Van Nuys Airport. Uh, I forget what they called that restaurant. Oh, the, the, um, uh, the trails. And uh, we told him about the history. I told, you know, first guy to fly it was uh, who, who that was. Um, I'm trying to think of his name. Then uh, um, uh, went through the whole thing. I said I had a good friend named Daryl Greenemeyer. He was the fifth guy to fly it. So by the time the, the other guy gets over there, he, he's, he's, this other guy is really hot. And he shows up and he starts screaming at us, you know, what the heck are you doing here? What? And the guard who was there talking to us, he turns around and says, relax. They know everything. <laughs> so uh, the the upshot was the uh, the guy that came the next day. He says, "Okay, well, I got to see some uh, driver's licenses and social security numbers." And there was, you know, they kept us there for maybe half an hour or so. And he said, "Okay, here's the deal: we want you guys to leave, drive in Las Vegas. In a week, 
you're going to get a call and you're going to get a briefing and then you're going to get a debriefing. And uh, so we left, drove back, and never heard another word. Huh. Uh, tell me this, John. Did you have a suspicion back then, or, or perhaps the best way to ask it would be, when did your suspicion about ET-type technology being out there, when did that develop? It was, I know a lot of people think it started with Bob Lazar, but it was be- well before that, wasn't it? Yeah, it was before that. Uh, see, the three guys that were interested in groom uh uh, and really did the research on the SR-71 and the U-2 were me, John Andrews, and Jim Goodall. And uh, John Andrews was the U-2 guy, uh, the interested guy, and uh, Jim, Gall, Jim Goodall was the SR-71 guy. It, you know, and I was just interested in secret airplanes, not about uh, you know UFOs. I didn't know anything about those. As a matter of fact, there's a famous letter floating around on the Internet that John Andrews, who was then vice president of testers, uh, wrote to me telling me about um, UFOs and that I should check into it. And the famous letter was the one I wrote back saying there's nothing to it. I already checked it out. <laughs> so I'm sure probably people have flashed that in your face now and then. Yeah. yeah. So when, uh, so do you know of the approximate year when, when you're hearing the, the ET stuff? Yeah, I think uh, 84 or 85, I was over at a friend's house in Las Vegas, and I picked up this book called Missing Time by Bud Hopkins. And I read that thing, and I'll tell you, the hairs on the back of my neck rose up because I knew instantly that that was true. Now, I don't know how I knew it was true, but I said, this, this is true. And That's when I, you started... Then I ran into the guy, the Air Force guy that I knew over in Laos. He was uh, one of the Ravens. Uh, you know, the sheep dip guys that they took out of the Air Force gave civilian ID and they flew in Laos for us. Uh, Greg uh, Wilson was his name. Um, he lives down in New Orleans, and I met him at one of the uh, Southeast Asia pilot reunions here in Vegas, and I think it was 1984. And we started talking, and uh, he told me he was at Bentwaters. Well, uh, station at Bentwaters flying A-10s. Well, I knew that Bentwaters figured into this story because in 1980 there was a landing there uh, of uh, three air of three saucers, and it was a big deal. It was called the, the Bentwater, Bentwaters incident, and there was a book about it. So I said, "Well, oh, Bentwaters," I said, uh, "Did you ever hear about the Bentwaters incident?" He said, "Yeah, I was there that night." He said, "I didn't get to go out and, and see the saucers, but I know the guys who did." And I said wait a minute, you mean this stuff is true? And he says, as far as I know it is. And then he told me the story. And those two things, Bud Hopkins' book and what Greg told me, were the ones that really set me off on saying, i got to find out what's going on. Now, you knew a lot of guys in aviation circles. You knew a lot of guys in intelligence circles, military circles. So, so you basically went on a one-man information campaign to find out what everybody knew, right? Right. And, and, and basically most of those guys knew nothing. And, um, you know, it was so secret. And then I took that little trip in 1987 where I went to, I drove all through um, Colorado, New Mexico. That's when I joined up with Linda Howe. And uh, we went down to Roswell and we ran into all those uh, mutilated cows. I mean, it was the most bizarre trip I ever made. And we, that's when we met Clifford Stone. And uh, I, I met uh, some of the UFO guys in Crestone, Colorado to exchange information with them. And and then on my way back, when I was coming back from Kingman, that's when the drive from Kingman to the dam was as black as black could be. Do you remember making that drive when it was black? Sure. You know, these days, I mean, there's lights the whole way, but those days, like 1987 is when uh, I drove back, it was black and something followed me and it scared the living daylights out of me. And it was, you know, it was just a light, or actually it was two lights, and it never threatened me, but it scared me to death. And uh, I got home, and, and that's when I wrote that, uh, you know, uh, the world is uh, round or whatever the thing it was. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I assembled all the information that I had and and started out, and that that's what started the whole thing. I was going through my John Lear files in preparation for this program and, and found some real treasures. And one of the things I have is the statement you released December 29th, 1987. Uh, uh, attached on the front of it is a handwritten note from you. Uh, some background information. Dear George, attached is some background information you may need for the next year. Happy holidays, which is quite a collector's item because this really puts you into the maelstrom, into the, into the eye of the storm of, uh, 
of UFOs and UFO theories, and and uh, you caught a lot of flack for it. Yeah, did I ever? And uh, you know, when I started talking about this, I had no idea that the military and the government not only knew all about it, but they were, you know, the, the, they were in on the whole thing. I, it just didn't occur to me. Let me ask you this. Something else I found in that file of John Lear stuff is a, an article from August of 1957 from the, I think it was called the NICAP Bulletin. It's about your father. And I was wondering if, I know you and I have talked about it privately about this before, whether you ever got any information on this subject from your father, William P. Lear Sr., but in this article, it, it notes, in a surprising reversal, it says, William P. Lear, noted aviation and electronics inventor, recently stated that the flying saucers do not carry creatures from other planets, but probably are intelligence-gathering devices launched from other worlds. In February 1955, Lear publicly revealed his belief that UFOs came from outer space and are piloted by beings of superior intelligence. Did you ever sit down with your dad and have a conversation about this? No. See, he got his hand slapped by uh, MJ-12. He was close to most of them, uh, particularly uh, Vandenberg, Hoyt Vandenberg, uh, was always at the house. He was one of the original members of MJ-12. As a matter of fact, my mom in later years, and I'm talking like 20 years ago, told, at, way after my father died, said that uh, Hoyt Vandenberg had had a crush on her. Uh, Jimmy Doolittle, who was as close to MJ-12 as you could get without having an MJ-12 number, he was always around the house. Uh, my dad was friends with Nathan Twining. My dad was on the board of um, of um, the Lovelace Clinic in New Mexico. They're the ones that did the autopsies on the aliens. He was really involved, but, you know, at the, during the time he was alive, I, he never discussed it with me, and I think he made some comments, but it's only in the recent, like, uh, three or four years that I found out how really involved he was. He was one of the uh, primary contractors on the uh, Annie Graff stuff, that was uh, developed between 1955 and 1958, and it was fully developed uh, after 1958. But that statement in 57 was was the response to the hand slap he got for his statement in Bogota. Uh, I'm just assuming that when he made that statement, it was totally unauthorized, and he got contact. He said, look, Bill, when we told you about these flying saucers, it didn't mean you were gonna, supposed to go out and tell all your friends about them. You don't suppose he was a member of MJ-12? No. Uh, do you? No. No, but he was in on uh, doing the anti grav stuff. He was he was right he was right there with with and he knew what was going on. I remember seeing news articles, old newspaper articles, including this this one I'm holding here that mentions about his anti gravity research and, and uh, he said there's a quote from him, once we can explain gravity, we can do something about it. And then poof, those articles it just it disappears. It, there's no more discussion of it in the public press. Do you think that was a result of him speaking about flying saucers or that they perhaps uh, that they were able to study those saucers to get our our clues about uh, how gravity works? They studied it and perfected it in 19, between 1950. Uh, they studied it uh, and then perfected it, had it perfected between 1958 and 1960. And that's why you don't see any articles of any kind in Aviation Week, Space Technology, Jane's Defense Weekly, nothing, no mention ever of any kind of research on anti-gravity, and the reason is they already have it. I know uh, you've had some ups and downs in your life because of your interest in UFOs, because of the things you've said publicly about them. Uh, I, I thought for a while that you'd given up on the topic because it was just too hard on you and your family, but now I see you sort of bounced back. Uh, you're involved in online discussions on an ongoing basis. Um, what happened? What, what's what's the deal with your, your personal life and your interest in the topic? Well, there, there were several times that uh, I, you know, just kind of either took a break or said, I don't want to do this anymore because it's so overwhelming when you realize what really is going on. It's so overwhelming that, you know, it, it's tough to take. So It's I, depressing, I, too, yeah. isn't it? Pardon? It's depressing. It's not depressing. Well, it's it's just, all I could say is it's overwhelming. So I took uh, you know a few months off. I think in '88 or '89, I can't remember. And then uh, um, the airline that I worked for in July of 1989 called me in one day and they said, "You don't actually believe this stuff, do you?" And I said, "Yeah." As a matter of fact, I do. And they said, "Well, we can't have a, a captain flying passengers that." 
that believes in UFOs. So you know, you need to take a, you need to find employment elsewhere. So they gave me uh, three months' pay, and I went and uh, started flying DC-8 flying uh, cargo out of Detroit, which was a lot of fun. You know, life has a way of working it out. I met a, a lot of good friends and. Uh, and I kind of um, let the UFO thing drop for uh, a few years. Uh, then I took it up a little bit, but then I really didn't get back until like 2003 or 2004 when, when Art Bell called me up and he said, uh, you know, hey, why don't we do another show? And so about that time, they were talking about disclosure. And, you know, uh, I think that's probably, you know, it's not that it's a ridiculous notion. It's just that it's never going to happen. Uh, so I had a few words to say about that, and I wrote the famous Lear Disclosure Briefing and uh, and just, you know, stayed in and out of it, and you know, I'm back in it, and I, uh, I uh, um, am on this forum called AboveTopSecret.com, and we discuss all of this. And what's fun about being on AboveTopSecret.com is there's so many guys with so many different ideas and you better be able to support yours because they will crucify you because they're so knowledgeable. I mean, there's guys that, you know, that to get on there and they really know what they're talking about. So if you can't back up what you're talking about, uh, you're toast. <laughs> you mentioned that you, uh, you don't believe disclosure is ever going to happen. You know, it seems like every other year or so somebody comes out with a statement. Oh yeah, it's just around the corner. Uh, the, the good guys on MJ-12 want to spill the beans, uh, but they're fighting with the bad guys in MJ-12, and any day now it's going to come spilling out, and of course, it never does. No, why do you, wh why do you suppose that it needs to be kept a secret? And maybe that goes to the, the center of your thesis that you released back there in 1987. Yeah, it goes to the core that uh, it's really none of our business. And uh, people say, well, what do you mean? i got a right to know if there's aliens on Earth. Well, you really don't because it's not about that. Uh, you need to just uh, continue on your life, be a good guy, uh, try and get rid of uh, the bad things in your life, which are uh, envy, hate, and greed, <clears throat> and uh, and just try and improve yourself. You don't need to know about what's going on in the background. Of course, some of us want to know, and uh, you know, and if you want to know, I'll tell you. But it's not like there should be a mass briefing on CNN where they come on, you know, the president comes on with his uh, uh, chief of staff and uh, his joint chiefs of staff and says, "Aliens are here," and you know, here's what, here's where they're from. That, that's never going to happen. It doesn't need to happen. Uh, disclosure happens on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, and that means that uh, when you're ready to know, you will be told. And uh, you won't be told by the government. You'll be told by someone else. I know that a lot of people in our listening audience will find this frustrating, but I'll, I'll have to make an admission here myself, is that the longer I, I stay in the field and, and keep tabs on what's going on and do my own research, the less inclined I am to uh, to advocate for a complete disclosure. I, I agree with you completely that it's not going to happen uh, perhaps for other reasons, perhaps because a lot of people would go to jail if they had to admit what they've been doing all this time. Uh, but also, uh, you know, I, I know that people think that they're ready. I, I know that they, they, they may be, in fact, ready for an idea that they're extraterrestrials. I'm not convinced that they're, they're necessarily ready for, uh, what could be a very disturbing truth, uh, uh about the reality of, of, uh, life in our universe and, and on our planet. You've nailed it. Exactly. As a matter of fact, I'm going to play that back and type it over because uh, you just said exactly what I feel. Why don't you give us a brief synopsis of, of what you came out with in the John Lear document? Because uh, you talk about startling. There were a lot of startling things in there that really shook uh, ufology down to its feet. Well, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to remember. I, I haven't read that thing in a long time, but basically I talked about what I found out uh in the in the year and a half before that, and it was basically that yes, there was a cover up. Yes, uh, extraterrestrials are uh, 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 here. That uh, a group named MJ12 uh, is dealing with them. That we have a lot of technology that we're trying to find out about. Uh, <clears throat> that there have been several agreements made. Uh, the agreements uh, were now. This is what I wrote in, in uh, back then. It doesn't mean I necessarily believe it now, but the, what I wrote was the agreements were that uh, in return for our permission uh, to abduct 
uh, a certain amount of humans that the aliens would give a certain technology. Um, there was also a little bit of the reports of the Grudge thir infamous Grudge 13 report, some of the uh, some of the gruesome uh, uh, UFO incidents that they had, and uh, basically uh, I ended up the uh, it wasn't a manifesto, but it was basically what I thought, and I said if you ever see a, a flying saucer with a, a saucer with beautiful. Uh, green and yellow and blue lights run like hell uh, because I didn't have anything else to say. Here's the <laughs> hilarious thing. Whitley Stryber, who used to call me practically every night uh, telling me about his experiences, uh, when he read that, he called me up and he said, I read your thing. And, and I said, yeah. And he says, were you say run like hell? And I said, yeah. He says, where? I mean, that was just hilarious. One of the things that you wrote in that uh, that paper was that you said that on April 30th, 1964, the first communication between aliens and the U.S. government took place at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. Three saucers landed at a prearranged area, and a meeting was held between the aliens and intelligence officers of the U.S. government. How do you know? That was uh, Bob Emenager told me that, and he's the one that uh, was uh, going to was approached in the 70s. He, he was part of Sandler Films, which uh, was a, a CIA cutout did the, did their work, and they said, "Look, uh, we're ready to release the story on UFOs. We're going to give you, and I think it was 10,000 feet of film of UFOs and and that meeting and everything." And they said, "We want you to tell the story," and that was. Um, the, the video that came out, UFOs Past, Present, and Future. But what happened is they made the, the movie and got everything ready, and at the last minute uh, they did have that footage, and at the last minute the Pentagon said, no, there's been a change in plans, we don't want to do it. And so the video that you see on uh, 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 that today is released, and there's several different names for it, uh, that's why there's no conclusion in the end and no footage. I mean that the story just ends. And but that was that was supposed to be the release. And uh, I've spent many hours with Robert Emenager. Uh He's retired now. I think he lives in the South somewhere. And uh, he told me all about the briefing they got and uh, <clears throat> about that home and meeting. Now that wasn't really the first one. The first one was in 1954 at uh, Edwards Air Force Base, which was then called Muroc Air Force Base. And that's when uh, Eisenhower had the famous meeting with the aliens there that uh, he supposedly went to the dentist. And that's where we've uh, had so much of the documented uh, material on, on that particular meeting. So there were several meetings. We're going to take a short break, John. When we come back, I want to ask you about the, the, the suggestion that there was some sort of a treaty to allow aliens to abduct humans. Stick around, folks. I'm George Knapp, uh, guest host here on Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. I'm George Knapp, your guest host. My guest this evening, John Lear. John, in the paper that you wrote back in December of 1987, one of the central points you made was that you believed, at least back then, that there had been some kind of a deal worked out between our military and these alien visitors that would allow them to abduct humans. Here's my question about about that prospect, and I don't know if you still believe that to be the case or not. But I, I always wondered, well, if that were true, why, why did the aliens have to make a deal? Couldn't they just do it on their own? Aren't they just still doing it on their own? Why would they need our permission if they're so technologically superior to us? You're absolutely correct. There's no reason why would they have to make a deal uh, with us. Uh, if they did, and I don't know that they did, uh, it was a scam on their part. You know, maybe we had found out about the abductions and, uh, and they, in order to placate the military, they said, well, look, here's the deal. We just want to, um, uh, and, and abduct a few. We'll give you the names and everything. And in return, we'll give you all this cool technology. And do you believe that they lived up to that part of the bargain? That the aliens? Yeah, that they did give us the technology oh, that perhaps was out yeah, at 51? Lots of cool technology. It's the other part they didn't live up to. I mean, you know, uh, everybody gets abducted. I, you know, I would, I thought, you know, in those days it was one in ten, but it's certainly more than that. One of the uh, other parts that you mentioned, you get into the stuff about Groom Lake in that paper back back when it was uh, that was the init my initial uh, introduction to the possibility that alien technology had been uh, 
had been tested and stored out there. This is prior to your involvement with Bob Lazar, right? Right. You you wrote that you felt that the the base had been closed down for a period uh, between 72 and 74, and a huge underground facility was constructed uh, out there, uh, which is where this bargain for technology was set into place. Do you do you believe that to be the case still? Yeah, there is certainly a, a huge underground facility there. Now, whether there's uh, uh, any current uh, saucer technology there uh, or not, I'm not sure. There is certainly uh, aliens there in that underground area there. That's that's a tough one to swallow, don't you think, for for people in the audience? I mean, even people that are that are interested in the subject, that there could be aliens out there working at a base alongside our personnel? Yeah, it sure is tough. And, uh, you know, if if they'd have been in my shoes for the last 20 years, talk to the people I talk to, you know, talk to the people, you know, that I have walked down the corridors and and uh, told the stories of you know passing aliens. Uh, they believe as I do, but I don't blame them for not believing it because just it's a tough story. I mean, you just cannot hardly you know grasp the fact that our military is working with aliens, and they probably you know they work with at least five different uh, uh, five to seven different species up there. It's not just one. There's all kinds of them up there, but that's how they keep the secret is people just don't believe it. You and I know a lot of people who've worked out there over the years in legitimate uh, classified programs, SR-71, U-2, stealth fighter and stealth bomber and things like that. And people like that who le- have legitimate credentials who are up there, they say, ah, that's that's a bunch of baloney. I never saw any flying saucers. What do you say to those folks? Is compartmentalization in, up there so severe, so strict, that even people who work there wouldn't necessarily know about this stuff? Absolutely. I would doubt that 99% of the people that work at Groom Lake don't know what's going on there. First of all, a lot of it's underground. Second of all, it's very compartmentalized. Uh, yes, I do knew, I know people who were heavily involved in, in projects up there and say, no, there's nothing like that. Uh, and I also know people who say, yeah, I saw those saucers around there all the time. You know, you uh, you had this interest in in the area in flying saucers and the possibility that saucers were up there. You put out this paper at the end of December of 1987, and then lo and behold, poof! Along comes a guy who seems to confirm your worst fears or your wildest suspicions. That guy being Bob Lazar, and a lot of folks think, well, that's just too darn convenient. It was extremely weird. What happened is, you remember, in the spring of. Uh, 1988, I was on my soapbox because at that time I didn't believe the military knew about this and I was, I wanted to tell, well I guess I did, I wanted to tell the, uh, the public about it. So I gave that lecture at the Spring Valley Library, I think, uh, two weeks in a row there and I got a call, uh, in like June or July, uh, from Gene Huff. And Gene says, hey listen, I, uh, uh, I'm interested in your stuff. And I'd like to get a copy of your tapes and stuff like that. Well, but that was one of the times I had withdrawn. And I was getting so many calls, and it was just so overwhelming. I said, look, I'm out of it. Um, I'm not going to have anything to do with it. And, uh, you know, uh, goodbye. And he said, well, okay, uh, if you ever change your mind, he says, I'm a real estate appraiser, uh, and I'll trade you an appraisal for your tapes. Well, that meant something to me because I needed a loan and uh, I needed a second mortgage on my house. So I said, okay, look, you do that and I'll give you everything I have. So I started copying all my stuff and got it all ready for him. And we made a uh, appointment. He comes over with this guy and uh, uh, he says, uh, I have my help here. We're going to measure your house. And we start talking. Turns out this guy's name is Bob Lazar. So as Gene and I are talking about saucers and Billy Myers and MJ-12 and all this stuff, this guy is rolling his eyes, and he can't make it plain enough that he thinks we're absolutely nuts. And so uh, Gene says, look, this guy worked at Los Alamos National Labs. Uh, you know, he's a scientist. He was a scientist there. He thinks we're nuts because he said if there was anything there that he would have known about it. And then Bob says, yeah, look, he said, I had the highest clearance. He said, I was the nosiest. I poked around everywhere. He said, if there was anything to this, I would have known about it. You know, didn't we hear that from Ned Day? So anyway, over that was like in the <clears throat> June or July of 88. Over the next three or four months, we started giving 
Bob Lazar information. And he was receptive. He said, okay, well, I'll look at it. And one or two, I think there was three things that really tipped him over. And one was the YY-2 secret address that we had at Los Alamos and uh, the fact that we knew about it and he didn't. Uh, and the other was, uh, I, I forget what the three things were. Oh, the grudge reports, he did find those uh, that were not supposed to exist. And there was a third one, I forget what it was. But anyway, around October, he had decided to reenter the scientific community to find out if this was true. And that's when he called <clears throat> Dr. Teller at Lawrence Livermore in California and uh, said, I want to re-enter the scientific community. And Teller says, do you want to work there in Nevada or work uh, here in California with me? And Bob said, I want to work at Area 51. And Teller says, let me see what I can do. That's when Bob got the three interviews at EG&G. And uh, I even have a typewritten piece of paper uh, of the second interview because he came over here. Because the first question on the second interview was, do you know John Lear and what do you think about John Lear? And Bob says, uh, the way I answered that question was, uh, yes, I know John Lear, and uh, I think he sticks his nose into places where it doesn't belong. And Bob said, what I didn't tell them is I also like to stick my nose into places it doesn't belong. <laughs> you would think that that would be an automatic disqualifier for someone to work in a program out there, uh, no matter what the that, program. And that's why I've always had this secret fear that Bob was brought into the program you know, as the first part of a disclosure of what was going on, and uh, and we were supposed to tell what was going on. There's so many little teeny, teeny hints. For instance, the first night he went there, December 6th, and he came back to my house and told me what was going on. I mean, you know they followed him. I mean, uh, and then when he when uh, Bob was telling me about it, uh, he said, I can't volunteer information, but I can answer your questions. And, uh, you know, it was like it was a setup, and it's never been uh, resolved in my mind whether or not, you know, it was a setup. Uh, now, I know this, or I feel all the stuff he told me was true, so the question is, were they purposely trying to get this information out? What did you think about him when you first met him? What was your impression of him as a person? Smart guy? Smart guy, and, uh, you know, he handed me his resume. His ha resume did have... The, it was a, a eight and a half uh, by eleven uh, little folder, and it did have the MIT and the uh, Caltech uh, degrees in there. Now, I had that resume. I kept it. It disappeared. I can't explain why there's no records of his um, of his schooling. I can't explain why uh, MIT doesn't have any records. I do know that he went to MIT uh, when he was working in Los Alamos. There are those who wonder if these two men were working with the government on some sort of a trial balloon, a psychological exercise to see whether or not a release of information about government knowledge of the ET reality might uh, cause a panic. All those theories have floated around over the years. We're going to come back with John Lear in just a minute and ask him uh, each one of those one by one, as well as... Uh, his relationship with Lazar, how it developed, uh, how this story unfolded, a uh, story that is now known all over the world. I'm George Knapp on Coast to Coast AM. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. I'm George Knapp, your guest host. My guest this evening, John Lear, the one and only. John, we've been talking about Area 51, Bob Lazar, uh, how you two first met and, and how you sort of... Uh, debriefed uh, uh, Bob about uh, UFOs in general and the cover-up. You know, you've heard the theories that I just discussed in that previous previous to that break about uh, all the things that have been said about you and about Bob and, and what you two were really up to over the years. Let's go through them. I, I'd, I'd like to give you the chance to answer some of these things. The, the fact that you guys were working in cahoots together to cook this whole thing up. What do you think? Sounds good, but first I want you to say hello to my friends at Above Top Secret. <laughs> hello, friends at Above Top Secret dot com. Thanks, George. All right. Um, tell me about uh, you know you've heard all those statements about you and Bob and who was playing whom and whether you're working in cahoots for the government and things of that sort. Uh, the idea that you created him, that you putting him up up to this. Let's let's deal with that one first. Well. I, I don't know how to answer that. I know nothing about physics. I wasn't the one that, and that, you know, that told us about gravity A and gravity B. Those are two real things. <clears throat> Bob Lazar gave us those. 
um, I don't think it's been released yet, but when uh, scientists do release what gravity really is, and it doesn't have nothing to do with gravitons, and there is two gravity waves, gravity A and gravity B, one works on an atomic scale and one works on a, a larger scale, uh, I didn't invent that. Uh, also, I didn't invent the element 115. Uh, and the properties and how it works and how it's uh, stable at 115 but unstable at 116. And the reaction uh, giving off the antimatter uh, and the access to the gravity A wave, which uh, allows travel, you know, uh, at hundreds of times the speed of light. So <clears throat> um, I didn't, uh, you know, Bob was the one that learned that up at S4, so... The, the idea that both of you did this as a disinformation plot to distract attention away from something else that was going on up there, I've heard that one more often in ufological circles over the years, and it seems to be the prevailing view among the UFO hierarchy that, uh, that it was a disinformation plan to to d- attract uh, distract attention from something else up there, which I've always thought that's if that were the plan, that was a really stupid plan because by saying they're flying saucers up there, he created an international sensation, drew tens of thousands of people. They're still going out there to look at whatever it is that's flying around out in in the skies above uh, Central Nevada. I agree. And uh, yeah, I, I agree 100 percent. I mean, uh, if if it was a disinformation, they they did, did the wrong thing. You mentioned something a couple of minutes ago before the break that you you said that in the back of your head you've always had the thought that maybe you were played by Bob, that he really was working with them. I, I mean, how much credibility do you give that possibility? No, what I meant to say was that I was being played by the people up at the test site um, through Bob, uh, that they wanted the information released, and they used Bob to come to me because I was the UFO guy and... Uh, and it was supposed to release it. What could be the reason for something like that, if that scenario were true? How does it make sense? There was a lot of guys that wanted the information out, and when I first started this, uh, George, I knew some guys, not particularly at Groom Lake, but I knew some test, guy, test site guys. I flew for Dyn Electron, and I flew that uh, B-26 and uh, the uh, OV-10 and the Huey and that... Uh, Turban uh, Beach that was out there on Patrick, that old hangar they had out there on Patrick Lane, and I, you know, I'd fly around there, um, uh, around the uh, underground nuke tests. And what I do is, is my job is depending on what airplane I was flying was, if the uh, if the nuke test vented, we were supposed to pick up samples of it, you know, and bring it back. And uh, one of the other things I did is before the nuke test, I'd fly around the uh, outside perimeter of the test site. And uh, between uh, 5,000 and 15,000 feet, and take uh, <clears throat> wind, uh, wind direction and speed, and uh, radio it down. And I knew a lot of the guys there. I also had a little gun shop called Special Weapons on there on Maryland Parkway and Trop. <clears throat> and a lot of the you know guys would drop in. Also, I knew the chief test pilot of um, Special Projects. He flew with me over in Laos. I knew a lot of those guys. So. Uh, you know, every once in a while, I, I get a little teeny tidbit of information, <clears throat> and um, uh, that's why I thought uh, that that it might be something like that. There was another guy that that hung around a lot. His name was Jerry Myers, and uh, I met him through the Confederate Air Force, and uh, he gave me a few tips. That was a really interesting little. Uh, scenario or the scenario there went on but the most important thing george is during that time and i'm talking about 87 88 um and part of 89 because it pretty much all stopped after uh the lazar thing uh, came about people would come to my door now i was an airline pilot and i was away most of the time but you know that i live here up on sunrise and people would come up and knock on the door and my wife would answer it and they'd say i can't give you my name i wanted to tell you that your husband is right that i work up in those black areas and i can't tell you how many times that happened and uh, people were trying to get the information out. So whether that was the story or not, I don't know. I know that there's been attempts to get the information out, that, that there are people that have that know that we were much further along in technology right now. We're 50 years ahead, and there's no reason why we can't have some of it. 
but uh, you know, but it's not being done. So uh, that's why I give credibility to, to some of those who say, well, maybe Lear and Lazar were used as uh, you know, kind of conduits trying to get the the information out. The only difference would be they call it disinformation, but it was real information. You know, I uh, I think a lot of people, as I mentioned in the UFO circles, certainly the UFO hierarchy, have dismissed the story. They they no longer believe it. They're open to the idea that maybe we had some technology out there. They just don't want to believe Bob uh, because of the problems in verifying his credentials and uh, academic credentials in particular, work history, things like that. I tell them, you know, when we have conversations, look, I know it's a hard thing to swallow. It's a hard story to believe. It's much easier to dismiss it because of all the things that have happened. But you don't know because you didn't live through it. That was a weird time. There were some weird things that happened um, that uh, shed light on the, the veracity of this story. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. You have nailed that. That time between 1987, 88, 89, the stuff that was going on in Vegas that you and I knew about, those the that girl that got murdered in her apartment over the Area 51 deal, remember that? Yes. Um, you know, just stuff like that was going on continually. And, you know, for people who didn't live here, they didn't live through that, so they weren't involved in it on a day-to-day basis like you and I were. Uh, for the the thing about the credentials, you know, that that's the problem that people have about Bob. And, and uh, you know, so many people have, have done the same steps that we did in the beginning and, and found out, well, he doesn't have any record at MIT or Caltech. They're They're not there. Uh, and, you know, they, they review, they find out the same thing later and think they've, they've got a big expose or something where, when in fact that information was presented in the very first story we aired about Bob. Um, but, but explain to me how it would work that a guy like him could get hired up there. You know, it's, it's question about what his, his clearances were. Uh, even if you buy the idea that he went to MIT or Caltech, He's a, he's an interesting character with a lot of different kinds of interests. The interest in the, in the legal brothel, the jet cars, the pirate uh, flag that would fly on top of his house, the desert blast events and, and making his own fireworks. I mean, uh, you can see a lot of reasons why people would, would worry about having him work at a, a place like that, wouldn't you think? Absolutely. And I think that, you know, one of the things when you hire into a program like that and you don't have a long history of being with with the government and they're going to upgrade you in a couple of months to the highest clearance level uh, in the United States, one thing they want to make damn sure is that they have a way to discredit you instantly if anything goes wrong. Uh, they're going to make that brothel known. They're going to, you know, make the, the fact that you don't have any uh, 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 um, education credentials, they're going to have all that in place first. So if anything goes wrong, they can instantly uh, dump you or discredit you. Well, that's some, one of the things that people say. Well, if this program were true, they'd have uh, scientist XYZ because those that guys like that are much more credible than somebody like Bob. But in fact, when you look at it through that prism, Bob may have been the most qualified guy in the world for that program because he's technically... Uh, Technically brilliant, you know, knows a lot about science, knows a lot about uh, mechanics and electronics and things of that sort, but he certainly would be an easy target to discredit. Absolutely. He had a broad education. He knew a lot of things about a lot of different things, and that's why when they went through the first, well, when they weren't for the first two interviews, and then he got the third interview, uh, that's, they probably said, hey, this is the kind of guy we need up there. Did he tell you right off the bat when he got hired, or did he wait a while? No, the first thing I, the last thing I knew before he went up there was the second interview, and that's the stuff I have typed up uh, when he came in and he said uh, they wanted to know about you, and um, there was three or four other things. I, I wish I had that piece of paper, but I don't have it right there. He got a third interview that he didn't tell me about. Now, the first time he went up there was December 6th. Now, he has that on that you know that log he kept you that calendar he always kept on his wall right every year and he put you know flight to that was the flight to nowhere <clears throat> well i looked up in my logbook and i was gone then so it must have been either the second uh it must have been the second time he went up there <clears throat> cuz i don't have a record of when he first came up here but it had to be like the 8th or 9th uh maybe the uh, second week in december and that's when he came in in the evening, like about 7 or 8 o'clock, 
and I'm sitting there, you know, writing checks or something, and I said, what's going on? And he said, I saw a disc today, and I, I thought I didn't hear him. I said, what? He said, I saw a disc today, and I said, theirs or ours? And he said, theirs. I said, you went to Area 51? And he said, yeah. I said, then what are you doing here? I said, why don't you get, you know, learn what's going on up there? I said, they might have followed you here, and, you know, you won't get to go up there again. And here's exactly what Lazar said. He said, John, you have taken so much crap over the last year that I have seen that you deserve to know that it's true. I saw it. I touched it. They're real. Well, in that sense, then, he violated a security oath pretty early in the going. Exactly, but the thing is, and you know, in and, and part of that conversation, he said, I'm allowed to tell you, I'm not allowed to volunteer anything, but I can answer questions. No kidding. So, um, and did he keep you appraised after subsequent events up there? Did he give yeah, you a little that, briefings? Yeah, he'd come over and, and tell me, um, uh, for instance, uh, you know, it's been told a hundred million times, and I'll just tell it again. And um, the night, uh, it was in January, and I read, I know in January, it was really cold. I had on a short sleeve shirt. He comes in. We no longer talked openly in my den because we knew it was been being recorded somehow. And I forget what the story is like that, but he gave me the high sign. And so we walked outside. You know how the, my den has a back door and it goes by the pool. And you walk out by that back gate, you know, where the, where the uh, stable is. Yes. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yes. So Bob and I walk out there and my wife is by the pool. He says, and she's always suspicious of what me and Bob are up to, you know, cause we're always getting in trouble. So she says, where are you guys going? And I said, oh, we're just going to go out in the, um, in the backyard for a second. So we went out that big wooden gate and Bob stood right there and he denies this, you know, to this day, but this is exactly what happened. This is exactly the way I remember it. He, he was, his eyes were shining brightly. He was, I mean, he was alive. He had something to tell me of great importance. And I said, what, what, what? And he said, John, you will never know what it's like to see your first live alien. I said, you saw it for sure. He said, yes. I said, it wasn't a doll or a puppet. No, I saw him. And then he told me, you know, he's walking down the hallway, guards on both sides. He comes by this door. There's a, a 12 inch by 12 inch uh, window that has the, uh, that had the wires through it. He looked through the window and there's two scientists in lab coats facing him with one of the grays facing away from him talking to the guys in lab coats. Now, Bob denies his story this day. He says, you know, something like, well, I told John I saw something, and he said, oh, that's an alien, that's an alien. That's not the way it happened, George. They, the way it happened is the way I just told you. So that's fine if, if Bob wants to deny it. You know, I can understand why he would have not taken so much flack, but that's the truth as I remember it. Then uh, in March uh, of 1989, you March take the... is when he was making the doggy death ray. And the doggy death ray was... Uh, uh, <laughs> my wife had some dogs, and uh, we had just planted a... I had just made her a little uh, Japanese garden, and they were digging up the garden. So Bob said, well, let, maybe let, let me make a, a, um, a high-pitched tone so that uh, it'll keep the dogs away. And we nicknamed it the doggy death ray. So that whole day, March 21st, we worked on this, or he worked on this little doggy death ray. It was just a little amplifier. And uh, towards the end of the day, he said, they're going to test fly tomorrow. Do you want to go see it? And I said, test fly what? And he said, one of the saucers. And I said, yeah, how can we do it? And he said, there's a back road into Groom Lake, which I knew about because I'd already driven it. He said, we can go down that. I said, we can see it from there. And he said, yeah. And I said, um, how do you know it's going to be tomorrow night? And he said, it's always on Wednesday night, just at, just at dusk. And uh, I said, great. So <clears throat> the next night, um, Gene uh, Huff and me and Bob, they showed up at my house because we were going to take my motor home. And uh, Jackie was with us. And uh, we loaded up the motor home. And uh, I think we left, I think, about maybe 6 o'clock. We drove up uh, Highway 15, got off at 93, went up 93, went through Alamo, turned uh, left on 375, and we're just halfway up that summit when the transmission gave out. 
and Bob said, hey, uh, you ever think about putting any transmission fluid in this? And uh, I said, I don't think I have. So Gene Huff got out and hitchhiked back down to Alamo, got some transmission fluid, came back, we poured it in, and it worked. And we came up top of the hill. Now it was about <clears throat> quarter, it was about 8.30, and we drove down the Groom Lake Road, parked, and got all our stuff, and at 8.45 is when the, the, uh, the light came up. <clears throat> now it was just a light. You couldn't see it was a saucer. It started jumping around the skies, and I'm trying to set up that 8-inch uh, Celestron scope. And when I finally get it lined up, the, the saucer is descending behind the mountains, and I got a good, like, 15-second look at it as it's descending, and I've described it. It was a disc oriented about 30 degrees to the rise, and it was, like, flowing. Something was flowing it off in a, in a gold or orange uh, substance, and it was a flying saucer. The dark side of some of the things that happened at, uh, at the world's best-known secret base, Area 51. Um, you know, John, uh, uh, you were talking about, uh, uh, we've been talking about uh, the reputation of Bob Lazar and how it's kind of been shredded uh, in the eyes of many people over the years. And, you know, they, the, uh, they will look at his lack of provable educational credentials, things of that sort. What they always seem to, uh, to bounce over or gloss over is that are the things that he knew that have been proven true. And the most, uh, the most important of those probably is the fact that there were test flights of flying saucers on Wednesday nights at Area 51. You know this because you went out there with them several times yourself or three times yourself and other, with other people and saw them and videotaped them. You know, I guess the question is, how did he know this, uh, otherwise? Because when this was happening, few people outside of Nevada it, it knew had ever heard of Area 51, let alone know that there were test flights of flying saucers on Wednesday evenings. Yeah, well, you know, I hear that, <clears throat> well, maybe Bob was at Groom Lake, but he he was he, he might have been a cook. I said, well, if he was a cook, then they were telling the cooks when the saucers flew. You know, it's, uh, it's hilarious what some of the things that people come up. But I just got a call from Goofon. Oh, Gene Huff. Yeah. Now, we got to explain to everybody that we all had nicknames, and uh, because all of the uh, UFO things were uh, like MUFON and KUFON and stuff like that, uh, we all became UFON. So Bob became BUFON, Gene Huff be became GUFON, and I didn't have a UFON. I was the captain until uh, Bill Cooper came out with his statement about being the uh, Condor, and then I became, my nickname became Condor. <laughs> and I was Nufon, I think, back in those days. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, were, we were talking before the break about uh, going out there, and you, uh, you saw this flight of a flying disc, a glowing object. You saw it through a telescope the first time. Second time you videotaped it, right? No. The second, this, well, no. The second night was the following that was uh, the following Wednesday, and that was uh, March 29th. And that was the night that, uh, or the day before, I had to go to uh, uh, Minneapolis on a flight with American Trans Air. And, and Tuesday night is when I called Bob from my hotel, and I said, what's going on? He said, uh, uh, we're going fishing tomorrow night. And, you know, meaning they're going to go to Groom Lake. So uh, I missed that night, but that's the, one, that's the night that, Jim Taliani went, and that was the night that, that somebody filmed it and got Jim Taliani on the audio, and that's why he got fired from uh, Tonopah Test Range. The third night was April 6th, the following, you know, the third Wednesday night, and that's the night that me, uh, Gene, um, uh, Bob, and uh, Jackie and Jackie's sister went, and the motorhome had... Uh, uh, was was down for maintenance, so we had to rent a car, and we put all this stuff in the in the trunk, the uh, Geiger counter, and the video camera, and everything. And we start driving down this road about 8:30, and we're going further and further. And I said, "Look, there's no point in going any further. We can't get more than a mile further. Why don't we just stop and set up the camera?" And so before we got stopped, uh, we you know we saw the lights of a couple of jeeps in front of us or security vehicles, and you know, we, we were uh, apprehensive, and so I said, okay, well, let's get out of here. And I was riding right seat, and I told uh, Jackie's um, uh, sister who was driving, I said, now, be careful around the 
turning around here because we don't want to get caught on this road. So we go whizzing down this road, this dirt road, in the middle of the night, you know, flying dust with the security vehicles chasing us. We get about three-quarters of the way to 375, the uh, the paved road, and uh, Bob says, look, stop. They're going to catch us. I can't afford to get caught. Let's uh, stop. I'll get out, and uh, you guys uh, talk with them, and when they leave, I'll get back in. So we stopped. Bob jumped out, ran into the desert, and he took a 9 millimeter with him. I don't know what he was going to do with that. You know, Bob, he was crazy anyway. <laughs> so uh, I get the uh, start getting the telescope out of the back of the trunk and setting it up when the security vehicles slid to a stop. And uh, so I went up and I threw my hands uh, on the top of their, you know, I made a a slamming motion on top of one of the vehicles. And uh, I said, holy smokes, you guys scared us. Uh, And they said, why is that? And I said, we thought you might be dopers. And I said, no, we we aren't dopers. We uh, need to uh, see some ID and and uh, get some information, and they they got out of their truck. They had uh, the guns, and um, um, they kind of circled around us, and uh, they took the information, and they said, you know, we we can't kick you off here because this is BLM land, and you have, you know, a a right to be here, but we don't want you here. So we'd appreciate it. Uh, You save yourselves a lot of trouble if you'll just leave. So they got in their car, turned around, and left, and we're standing there in the desert with the trunk lid open with a light, <clears throat> and Bob comes out of the desert about 10 minutes later, and uh, we all start laughing and joking and talking about flying saucers, and and Bob says, yeah, I was over there. I said, I had the one of the security guards' head lined up. If he came towards me, you know, I was going to blow him away and, and all this, and, and all the time we're, we didn't realize that the security guys didn't go very far. They just went out of our range of seeing and turned around and were filming us and recording what we were saying. So after about 10 minutes of all that, we put the uh, telescope back in the trunk. We all got in the car and we headed, started to head home. Well, we no sooner got onto the uh, paved portion of the highway when we, the lights and sirens of um, the police of the sheriff vehicle came on and their bullhorn get out of the car and put your hands on top of the car and da 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 so we all get out of the car and put our hands on top of the car and there's me and Jean and uh, Jackie and um, her sister and Bob and the the guy's name was Doug Lamoureux do you remember him I sure do so Doug says and at that time you know that was when we first met Doug and just he was a sweet guy he was a neat guy, but of course that we didn't know that. He was playing Mr. Sheriff, and he says, "Okay." He says, "I got two questions." He said, "Number one, I want to know where the nine millimeter is, and number two, I want to know why there's five people in this vehicle now, and when security checked you 15 minutes ago, there was only four people." So it was amazing, George. I mean, for one solid hour. We hemmed and hawed, and nobody said anything. And this, and Doug kept saying, uh, "All I have to do is go into town, get a search warrant, come back here, and pound your car, and toss you guys in." I need the answer to those two questions. Well, <clears throat> we never answered the question. And one hour later, Doug said, came up to us, and he said, "Okay, here's the deal. What I've been told, and I don't know why I've been told this. I've been told to let you guys go. Now I don't want to see you back here again." So he let us go. We got in the car, uh, went on home, and uh, the next morning is the morning that uh, Dennis Mariana called up Bob and said, you know, I don't want you to go to the airport today. I'm going to pick you up and uh, uh, go from there. And that's when he took Bob to Indian Springs, <coughs> excuse me, which is the, um, the head of uh, all security for the test site and the Nellis Range. And that's when they took Bob out. Uh, according to Bob, with a gun in his ear and took him into that little building and said, now, Bob, when we gave you clearance to work on these flying saucers, it didn't mean you were supposed to tell all your friends about them. <laughs> now, do you want to work here or not? And uh, Bob says he was noncommittal because he didn't know whether he wanted to work there or not. 
And, Let's take, uh, I'm going to have to stop you there for a second, John. We need to take a short break again, but I want to continue this fascinating story. It sure brings back some memories for us. My name is George Knapp. I'm with John Lear here on Coast to Coast AM. Stick around. Welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. I'm George Knapp. We're joined by our special guest, uh, John Lear. We're talking about the early days of the Area 51 legend, um, specifically recapping a story about how John Lear accompanied Bob Lazar and a couple of other folks on trips out to Groom Lake to personally witness flights of what sure looked a heck of a lot like a flying saucer on subsequent weeks in 1989 and on the last trip of course you got uh, you got popped essentially and then Bob got called onto the carpet John and then uh, and then his life sort of went into a tailspin after that he he agreed to do an interview with us uh, in in shadow shot out in front of your house a live interview with the uh, we used the term Dennis which was the uh, the name of his boss out at uh, area 51 or S4 and then after that boy it really hit the fan didn't it yeah and uh, two things here. Number one is uh, uh, I already had you say hello to AboveTopSecret.com, right? Yes. Okay. Goofon just called again, and I wanted to tell you what he said. He said he, you know that calendar I said that Bob kept? Yes. He said that he has it, and he's amazed at how accurate my dates are. And he's going to try it and call in later. Great, good. He says, that, that's amazing. He says, I'm really enjoying this because, you know, I don't know how he can remember those dates. And I said, because I have to tell a story every day. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. you, yeah, um, you, you would live through some of these events. You know, a lot of folks think that Bob exaggerated the things that happened to him, that it never could have happened. Nobody shot out his tires. People weren't breaking into his home, but you lived through it. I was around for a lot of that stuff. And, and, and it sure as heck looked like a lot of that really did occur. Right. Now, remember on Sunday, we did the third uh, on-the-record uh, interview. Right. And that was the week after we Bob got caught at the test site. Okay, so you called me the next morning, and you said, John, I've, um, the phone is ringing off the hook. What can we do for an encore? And I said, let me see if, if Bob is ready to spill the beans. And so I called Bob, and I said, George wants to do an interview. What do you think? He said, as long as I'm in shadow. So I called you back, and you said, yeah, you could send the truck up to my house. As a matter of fact, I have the video of us doing that. And uh, and he wanted to be he wanted to be called Dennis, which was a inside joke on Dennis Mariana, who he worked for. And uh, you sent the truck up here, and we did that interview that night. And, I mean, all heck broke loose after that interview. And we did that in my driveway. And so I can't remember it was the next night or a few nights after that. It was actually in the afternoon. Bob came over to my house, and he was just, I mean, he was beside himself. I'd never seen him look so unhappy. I said, what happened? He said, I just had my tire shot out. And I said, uh, oh, what happened? He said, I was just uh, turning on to the Highway 15 off of, on uh, from Charleston. And he said, the guys came up behind me and shot the tires out, or one tire out. And I said, did you see him? And he said, no, I couldn't see anything. I pulled over, changed the tire, and I drove over here. And he said, look, I'm going to turn myself in. I said, to who? And uh, I said, don't do that. And so that was the night that Bob stayed over, uh, stayed on my couch because he didn't want to go home. The and break-ins at his house, those were real, weren't they? The what? He had break-ins at his home where people yeah. would go in and uh, leave all the doors and windows uh, open. Yeah. Uh, and... I can't remember. Refresh my memory. Uh, if if Goofon would call and he can remember when we got the 115. I think it was a couple of weeks uh, after that. Do you remember? I don't. But we can recap for our listeners. Uh, 115 is what Lazar claimed was the um, was the fuel basically that uh, powered the reactor that uh, that launched these flying saucers that were out at uh, S uh, S4, which is an area uh, Papoose Dry Lake bed uh, where he said he worked in a, an underground hidden facility. And, uh, and they had nine of these flying saucers, uh, stashed there. Um, 115, of course, at the time that Bob, uh, first mentioned it didn't exist. It has since been synthesized in a very small amount, of, uh, and it, it didn't have a very much of a half-life. Uh, so it's not exactly as stable as he described it, but in conversations I've had with him in recent years, um, he says that, uh, he still believes that there could be a, some sort of an isotope of 115 that could be made stable. You know much yeah. about that, John? Yeah, it only occurs naturally, uh, and it can occur naturally. 
in in our solar system anyway, and uh, and they can't synthesize uh, synthesize it to, at least to what he had. Now, when he and I and uh, Joe Vanninetti did the uh, the experiment, what we did was we took uh, a piece of dry ice and we put a bell jar over the dry ice. We put the 115 on the uh, the dry ice, and then we took a Coleman lantern mantle which would uh, release uh, radioactive uh, alpha rays, which, which are supposed to shoot off into uh, space at, uh, at the speed of light. And we watched them, and the reason we did the dry ice, it, was, it would form a fog inside this bell jar, and we could see the alpha particles being sucked back down into the 115. And basically what Bob was trying to show us was the attractive properties of the uh, 115. 115. You know, the, uh, after that, I mean, all the stuff that happened to Bob and, and he had personal problems and legal troubles and things of that sort. And, and in the views of many, he's been discredited and they, they've discredited the whole story out there. But, but despite, in spite of that, a lot of people still believe him. And, uh, and the effect on, uh, that area, Rachel and Area 51 has just been mind boggling, isn't it for you? I mean, could you have ever imagined that Area 51 would become uh, a household name all over the world that would it would spawn so many cottage industries. I mean, not just T-shirts and trinkets and ashtrays and things like that and bumper stickers and posters, but there are rock bands named Area 51. There's a rock band named Element 115. Some folks from uh, Phoenix who are pretty talented. There's there have been bars named Area 51, and and then there's the Little Alien and the ET Highway and video games and. And movies and books and screenplays and documentaries and, and news coverage from all over the world. Did you ever imagine it would be this big? No, and it's crazy when you think about how back in those days, you know, it was Gene Huff and Bob Lazar and, and you and me, and, and that was it. And we were trying to get a story out. And uh, just just look at and just imagine how long that was ago. That's been 20 years ago. You know, people, you know, uh, you know, weren't, weren't even born that are now that are real interested in that stuff. And that happened to us. Makes you wish you had a piece of the action, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. You, uh, you had some, uh, you, ad- adventures with Bob where you traveled to Los Alamos. That's another knock on him. He claimed to work at Los Alamos in sensitive positions and, and folks, uh, you know, it took me a couple of years to get them to finally admit that they had a record that, he was, in fact, there after they denied it for so long. What were the circumstances of you and Bob going to Los Alamos for? Bob had a contract uh, to repair alpha probes for uh, Los Alamos, and there was about 300 of them. And about every six weeks, we'd drive there, and uh, it took about 14 hours to get there. And uh, we'd set up a kitchen table at a kitchen table of a friend's house, and we'd repair these alpha probes. And it took about... Oh, anywhere from 16 uh, to 20 hours, and uh, we'd strip them first, and then I'd uh, then he'd put the wire in them, and I'd put the aluminum cover on them, and uh, it, it just took a long time to do. And then um, when we were done, he'd put them in a box, put the bill there, we'd jump in the car and drive back to Las Vegas. When he started making a little money, uh, he started taking an airplane or an airline, and since I had jump seat privileges. I just get on the jump seat of the airplane. We go together, get to Albuquerque, rent the car, drive up to Los Alamos, fix the probes, and come back. Well, this one time we did it. We we jumped, got it the Hertz rent a car, uh, got into it, drove to Los Alamos, and everything went just perfect. And we finished all 300 probes in eight hours. And we had enough time to get back to uh, <clears throat> Albuquerque, get on the airplane. And come back and have dinner at Parma's. So we go racing down the hill from Los Alamos, 100 miles an hour. We get to the rent, Hertz rent a car place, turn in the car, uh, get the, the bus to the airport. We go running up the steps. Bob runs into, uh, into the jetway on the airplane. I get my uh, pass at the uh, counter, um, jump seat pass, run onto the airplane. They shut the door, and we're starting to push back. And I heard the pilot say, um, uh, welcome aboard uh, Southwest Airlines 453 to Los Angeles. And I'm thinking, oh, no, I got on the wrong airplane. And, of course, Bob is pushing back on the airplane to Las Vegas, and he's wondering, where's John? 
this possibility of whether or not they messed with his mind. You'll recall that he told a story about drinking some kind of a liquid that uh, that uh, tasted like pine, and he had intimidation tactics and threats that were used on him. Do you think it's possible that they planted any of this stuff in his head, um, seeing the alien, that sort of thing? It's possible. i got to admit that, but <clears throat> I think he saw it. By the way, uh, Gufon called, and he wanted me to remind you that we have a minor league baseball uh, team named the Area 51. That's right. Uh, the Las Vegas, uh, the AAA affiliate of the Los Angeles Dodgers is the the 51s. In fact, uh, I'll, I'll put in another plug. This year, uh, the, every year on the birthday of Nevada, uh, they have a big parade up in our capital of Carson City. This year's theme is Area 51. And uh, guess who the Grand Marshal is? That would be me. Anyway, so it's, <laughs> and I wanted to tell all my friends at uh, the Nighthawk Zone and Fantastic Forum, I know you've heard these stories before, but this is the first time I've had a chance to tell it with George, who was there when it was all happening. All right. Well, um, tell me this. Do you believe that Bob's life was in danger back during that period, that it was legitimately in danger? Well, that's the thing, and that's the thing that Bob said on his uh, on that one videotape that, that you did that nobody has seen. Uh, very few people have seen. As a matter of fact, I played it the other night for uh, a friend of mine where he says, look, uh, if you're going to kill somebody, you know, you do it, especially a big organization like that. You don't threaten them. You don't say we're going to kill you. You just do it. And they never did. So bottom what's the deal? Bottom line on the story, John, how much of it do you still believe? How much of it still rings true for you? 110%. Tell me this. Do you still keep tabs on what goes on out at uh, Test Site, Area 51, Tonopah Range? How closely? I'm right on top of it. I don't know if you saw. As on on top as you could be, because after 1990, whoever is in charge of secrecy at the government, they found out how to keep a secret. Nobody ever came to my house again, and it's been really hard finding out information, but I still have sources, and I'm pretty much on top of what's going on out there. You think that the example, the legal troubles that Bob got into, whether or not the government was related to that, that uh, that the message was driven home, that they used that uh, situation to say, see what can happen to you if you spill your spill your guts? You mean recently or back then? Back then. Yeah, I think that was, uh, I think that whole, um, brothel thing was, was some kind of mind control because I remember asking Bob when, when he was setting it up for the girl, what was her name? I, you remember the girl's name? Uh, it's escaping me right now. Anyway, when he was setting up, I said, Bob, look, this is insane. I mean, you know they're going to find out about this. Why are you doing this? And uh, he said, oh, I just, you know, it's something I want to do. It didn't make sense at the time. It doesn't make sense now. And, of course, you know, everybody found out about it. And, uh, you know, for those who didn't know Bob, it, it you know, uh, it totally discredited him. But, you know, the fact is I was right there and I saw it happen. So um, it was a different story for me. Let's talk about Area 51 now and the test site. Uh, of course, we, we broke a story uh, earlier this this uh, month uh, about this gigantic new hangar that's going in out there at Area 51. It was uh, there's photos of this uh, can be seen online at a couple of places at uh, DreamlandResort.com, also at LazyRanch.com. Uh, photos taken from miles away, but they're really great photos. Something really big. I, I don't, we don't know what's going in there. It would be just pure speculation to guess about it, but it looks like maybe it might be another secret plane of some sort. You have any guesses yourself? Well, Area 51 Groom Lake is a low-level place now. There are certainly secret projects that go on, but uh, in 1989, 1990, most of, a lot of the secret stuff moved up to uh, Idaho, just out about 45 minutes out of Twin Falls. And uh, they're the main new secret base that they're using uh, Groom Lake to cover. They're letting everybody see it. The real place is Sandia, and Sandia is located... Uh, Halfway between Donapot Test Range and, uh, and Group Lake, there's, uh, you know, there's three or four runways there, huge hangars. Uh, part of Sandia, it extends up on the Paiute Mesa. There's, uh, 
massive, massive underground facilities, which includes um, uh, places for uh, people to live, uh, and, and it's a huge place, but it's kept real secret. It was built between 1980 and 1987. Uh, it was opened in 1987. It's 20 years old now. Uh, I have friends that not only work there, but, uh, help build it. I had friends that uh, helped build the runway. Uh, it, it's a massive place, but you don't hear about it, uh, very much. Uh, Groom Lake is, uh, used as a place where now they take senators and congressmen and say, we're going to let you in on all this really secret stuff. And, uh, you know, that's how they get their appropriations is, is showing them stuff. So the people who look at Area 51 and think there's anything really, really secret going on there, they're wrong. I mean, there is a lot of secret stuff going on that's far, far beyond Area 51. Well, what's your guess about what's going on at, at Tonopah Test Range at the Sandia site you just mentioned? There is a lot of uh, uh, new aircraft. Um, you know, uh, people look at uh, the F-22 and they think that's a state-of-the-art and, and all the rest of the stuff. We have stuff that, uh, you know, is just amazing. They, the cover-up is, is, is so well done, and there are so many levels of it that uh, people just, I, I just, it would boggle their mind. I know of at least three major bases around the state of Nevada that are on dry lakes that are underground that, you know, I don't think they even have permission from BLM to put it there. And, uh, you know, Google is regularly shot, photoshopped by the military. There's no chance of finding anything on Google or any other satellite imagery place. It's all photoshopped by the military. Um, you've you've heard the stories and uh, about an an SR seventy two, uh, about an, an Aurora, about Black Manta, about any number of other programs. Do you think those things, any of those, or all of those, are real, and that, that they might be uh, being test flown out at some of the facilities you you've just mentioned? Absolutely, they were real thirty years ago. Bob saw the Aurora, you know, in nineteen eighty eight, so or nineteen eighty nine. Uh, you know, there's tremendous. Uh, strides being made in, in secret aircraft, but we don't get to hear about it anymore. But, um, um, and UAVs? UAVs, yeah. They're yes. Being flown out of uh, Creech. Creech. Creech yes. Air Force Base, which is the new name for uh, <clears throat> Indian Springs. Right. Uh, I had heard that they might have uh, insect sized UAVs that they're flying around out there somewhere. George, they have all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's just amazing what what uh, they have that we don't know about. And would you say that some of these new advanced uh, technologies, aircraft, are based on things that they learned from the saucers uh, that were there there at S four? Certainly, um, certainly, a lot of that is uh, is stuff that they learn. But you know, our technology is so advanced. Uh, let me let me take you a step further. Uh, in 1962, remember I told you the uh, the saucer or the anti-grav technology had been perfected in 1958. Yes. Um, our first trip to the moon was in 1962. Our first trip to Mars was in 1966. We've explored most of the solar system by now, and we've probably gone to the stars. Everything that you've seen or read about Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, the space lab, um, uh, the space shuttle, the International Space Station is all cover. It's a hundred billion dollar cover up for what's really going on. Uh, as fantastic as that sounds, <clears throat> when I first talked about, you know, flying saucers, you had uh, trouble believing it then. The stuff that I'm telling you is real. I mean, we've been, we have bases on the moon, people live there. Uh, we've been to Mars. Uh, I've made some really good contacts, and that's what's going on. You're going to have to go back on the UFO circuit, John, to tell those stories. We're going to take another short break. When we come back, we'll have another 15 minutes one-on-one -on -one with you uh, to talk about uh, disinformation and other topics. And then and then at the top of the hour, we're going to open it up to, uh, to our phone line. So stick around. I'm George Knapp on Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. I'm George Knapp, guest host, and my guest tonight is uh, John Lear. We're talking about Area 51 and a lot of other related topics. John, I want to touch on 
on something that's sort of a sore spot in, in ufology and in ufological circles, and that's the idea of disinformation. You know, whenever some ufologist gets mad at some other ufologist, he accuses him of being a disinformation agent, and it's kind of like the equivalent of saying your mama, something like that. You've been accused of... <laughs> yeah, that sure happened a lot but with uh, Bill Cooper and the uh, rest of the guys. Uh, you've been accused of it. I've been accused of it. Bob Lazar has been accused of it. You made that accusation yourself a long time ago about a guy named Bill Moore. And, uh, you know, Bill Moore has done a lot of good, solid work in, in, in ufology, particularly on the Roswell case. But you wrote in that 1987 paper that you thought Bill Moore was a government agent. And, in fact, it turned out two years later he admitted he was working with some disinformation people. How did you know? Um, I... I forget how I knew that, uh, but yeah, he was working on. Uh, he was uh, running uh, the Benowitz deal with uh, Doty, and I don't. I don't remember how I knew he was a disinformation agent. Did you have any involvement with what happened to Paul Benowitz, or were you monitoring that? Were you aware of it as it was going on? You know, when I heard about the Benefits deal, I went to uh, Albuquerque. I stayed with him for two nights. I got briefed by him. He's the one that gave me uh, the. Uh, uh, the x-ray of Judy Doherty that had the little thing in her neck, uh, that ended up with Ron Regeer, and Ron Regeer says he doesn't remember what happened to it. But anyway, uh, you know, I got the original story that uh, uh, Jim McCampbell wrote about the Judy Doherty abduction about Dulcie. That's when we uh, and, uh, got the um, confirmation that Dulcie existed. You know, uh, when I was at the Crestone meeting, uh, Adams, um, I forget what his first name was, who gave me the note of the contact at Henderson, who had given me, uh, who had been given one of the boxes to be hidden, uh, by, um, uh, the guy, the security guard at Dulcie. <clears throat> Dulcie is a real sore spot with a lot of people. They can't believe that there's an underground base there that's uh, co-jointly uh, occupied by the U.S. military and aliens, but in fact, it's true. And uh, this one security guard, uh, I think his name was, um, trying to, I can't remember, Costello or something like that, uh, and he knew the person in Henderson that I did. And um, subsequent to that, when uh, and I learned about that before I met Bob, when Bob got the uh, read the briefings at Air, at uh, S4, uh, he read about the altercation uh, in which the uh, 44 Delta Force uh, and the scientists were killed. Now it didn't specify specifically say Dulcie. He got the impression it was Area 51, but his clearance may have been not uh, at the level to hear about Dulcie yet. But, in fact, the alterca altercation in which the 44 people were killed was at Dulcie. You know, we were mentioning about Bill Moore in 1989 at a MUFON symposium here in, held here in Las Vegas, the first one I ever attended. <clears throat> he, uh, he startled everyone by admitting that he had worked with AFOSI guys uh, on regarding Paul Benowitz basically drove the guy over the edge. Uh, Bill Moore's explanation was that he he knew these guys were disinformation experts, uh, psych war uh, operatives, and that he was working with them because he wanted to know more about what these guys were up to. And so that's why he cooperated. Tell me this. How much r legitimate, real disinformation on the part of the government, uh, operations like that, black operations to disrupt and muddy the waters, uh, is it, do you think is going on? Uh, a lot of it. A lot of it. I can't tell you exactly what. Um, you know, when I talk and, and, and uh, tell people about, you know, my experiences, uh, I tell them exactly what happened to me. And, you know, I don't know for sure, you know, whether Benefit Benowitz, uh, knew exactly what was going on, but he certainly knew about Dulcie, and he knew about Archuleta Mesa, and he's the one that went up there with Gabe Valdez, and they're the ones that found the um, uh, part of the wreckage of the black airplane that crashed up there. There was too many things that happened to Benowitz that he could prove uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, for Bill Moore to say that it was a, uh, uh, a disinformation campaign. Not to mention the fact that I spent uh, at least several days with Colonel Ernie Edwards, who backed up Benowitz. You know, in ufology, uh, you, you get paranoid. Uh, you stick around it long enough, and you start seeing disinformation agents under every rock. And uh, uh, it just I, makes me wonder how much there really is, because as you know, John, 
ufologists shoot themselves in the foot uh, every chance they get. They're their own worst enemies. There's all the infighting that goes on. Everyone accuses everyone else of being full of it. You would think that the government wouldn't really have to work too hard to discredit the whole field because the ufologists do it for themselves. <laughs> That's a good analogy. That's great. So do you think that there is actual uh, infiltration of, say, UFO organizations anymore, or they have agents out there uh, posing as ufologists? You know, I just don't know. It doesn't seem like they'd have to, does it? No, not really. Let me get your take on this. One of the other things you mentioned in that original paper long ago uh, was about cattle mutilations. You had mentioned about uh, traveling down and, and conversing with Linda Moulton Howe, of course, who's done you know, the seminal work on this subject and really brought it to uh, to the fore uh, years ago and continues to do so. What do you what do you make of that? You know, because it's still going on. It doesn't seem to get much much uh, media coverage because they, they seem to have done a good job of passing on this story that it's uh, coyotes or Satan worshipers or something. Well, what do you make of it? Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, Linda and I drove from Albuquerque. We were going down to Roswell <clears throat> to see Clifford Stone. Uh, we went into Corona, and as we're going down that valley, we had these A7s that were doing low passes on my truck. And I stopped. I said, Linda, this is weird. Uh, anyway, from Corona, we took that dirt road that goes over that connects with the other road to Roswell, and I think it's like about 25 miles. <clears throat> you get halfway between it, and there's supposed to be, at least there's supposed to be a town on the map called NAN, NAN. We got there, and there's nothing there except 25 mutilated cows. And, uh, we started looking around. I said, this is crazy. How could I be driving a truck with Linda Moulton Howe and just happen to drive into 25 mutilated cows? So we drove south to where the original uh, ranch was, where, um, what's his name? What was the guy that, uh, the Roswell guy that uh, found the Brazel. ranch? Brazel. Yeah, Not we drove Brazel. towards Brazel Ranch uh, on this road, and we got to this rancher, and we said, you know, what's the deal with all those cows? And he said, oh, they uh, they have this infection, and the uh, health department has told us to uh, cordon off the area, and they're going to take uh, care of it. And then <clears throat> Linda researched the story, and I don't remember what happened to that, but, but that was just weird. And, yes, those cattle mutilations go on, so I don't know what it's all about. Well, it's just so strange that whoever is doing it leaves the carcasses behind in such a, a you know, oddly cut-up way. You know, some that uh, appear to have been used uh, high heat instruments, uh, the cord anus, the, the tongues and strips of flesh from the jaw. It, it just seems like perhaps the reason that the carcasses are left behind is to, is to have the psychological effect, the unnerving effect of, of having them discovered by people. But I, I just can't figure out what the purpose of that w would be. Well, and there's plenty of examples of them doing the same thing to humans. The B-52 that crashed in Vietnam that Clifford Stone, uh, uh, investigated that all those B-52 crew members exact mutilations like like you just uh, described then the one in uh, El Magordo that was uh, described in uh, the Grudge 13 papers was exactly the same what's your take on the latest Roswell uh, uh, revelations you know we see Walter Hott came out uh, uh, posthumously with his statement of that uh, about the cover-up uh, it just seems like uh, you know Roswell that's a it's a solid story, but it just seems like it, uh, it's been so hopelessly polluted over the years by so many conflicting accounts. I, I'll tell you what, John, before you answer that, we're going to have to take another short break. Welcome back, everyone. We have one hour left with our guest tonight, John Lear, going to be taking your questions in just a moment. But I wanted to give John a chance to answer the question that we we uh, we had to cut off from because of the break. John, about Roswell, uh, you know, it's been – there's so, so many arguments about uh, – uh, was it one crash or two where the location was? Were there bodies or weren't there any bodies? Then you got four different versions coming out by the government. It seems like they keep lying about it but muddying the waters. Do you think the Roswell story, the, the core of the story, still holds up? And, and what do you make about the newest revelations, Walter Hott's uh, uh, statements, uh, posthumous statements, these two new books uh, out, one by Jesse Marcel Jr. and the other by Don Schmidt? Are you up on it? Yeah, I think that uh, Roswell still holds up, and I think uh, Jesse Marcel Jr. is telling the truth. I think Walter Hart is telling the truth. Uh, I don't know why the 
waters are muddied. I don't know why anybody would expect anything different. The Air Force is certainly going to not come and say, yeah, Walter Hot, yeah, well, that's that's what we really happened. You know, he caught us. <laughs> We're going to go to our lines now. We're going to first go to east of the Rockies. Melissa in Michigan has a question. Melissa, you there? Yes. Hi. How are you guys this morning? Good. We're okay. Um, What's on your mind? John, I had a question for you. Um, back in 89, around 88, 89, I worked with my mom at a little department store, and there's a lady that used to come in there that we all thought was crazy, and my mom had pulled me aside one day and told me that she wasn't crazy, that she worked in the, with the government on black ops projects, and when she came home, she was reprogrammed. Yeah. And... I was just wondering, you know, why, you know, do they feel they have to do that with people anymore? And could they, and could they have done things like that to uh, Bob Lazar, put things in his mind, like he had said, to make him think that he was actually in them areas? Absolutely. Programming is so advanced now. In the days of um, uh, Bob Lazar, they were still using drugs. I, I, I don't know how they do it these days, but... The, uh, from what I've been able to uh, find out, uh, you can work on a project. You can actually walk inside a door, work on a, in a building, work on a project for like 30 or 40 minutes, walk outside that door, have no recollection of what you worked on, uh, and not have it bother you. And uh, so all this programming is, uh, is, is really reached a, a very fine point. Oh, I also just wanted to make a, a comment that the Aurora's do exist. I have. Uh, I was in uh, Northern California when I was in the military, and around I'd say March or April of '95, before I had gotten out, they had closed our SR-71 hangars, and our pilots were no longer to fly after dark, and all of our crew and the towers and everything were all sent home, and special people were brought in, and we. Before I left, I was informed that those were the Aurora's back in the hangars. Yeah, I have no doubt uh, that would be that time frame would be uh, approximate. I think there were seven Aurora's built. Uh, they were extremely loud. Bob saw them fly once. Uh, we had lots of other airplanes, but that that story rings true. We shut down the uh, SR-70 program in 1990 uh, and uh, started giving them to different uh, museums, and I think there was only three left flying, the one we gave to Russia and uh, two that uh, NASA had. I'm not sure how many are flying today, but the story you tell just really rings true. Well, I, you know, I did with the U-2 project, and you know, just dealing with them and knowing some of the things that they had done was completely just amazing. Yeah. And, if, you know, if the things that weren't going on today, I would go back in a heartbeat. Yeah. Did you, uh, did, Melissa, you never actually saw the Aurora. You just heard heard of it when you were in the military? We weren't allowed around there in that area past start, but I live just off the base where you could hear them fly above because I didn't live anywhere near an airport. And you could hear them loud as, you know, any airplane just, like, launching off. And it was just, it, it'd wake you up in the middle of the night if they flew close enough overhead of you. And what part of California was this in? I was in Beale Air Force Base. Oh, at Beale. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Sure. Yes. <laughs> and that was out in the middle of nowhere, so you could actually go somewhere and, you know, bring something there, and nobody would ever know about it. Yeah. yeah. That's right. They had the blackbirds up there. Melissa, thank right. you for the call. We're going to go to Bill, west of the Rockies. Bill's in California. Bill, you there? Yeah, I sure am. Good evening, gentlemen. Howdy. Hi. I'm a uh, special effects artist. I'm sort of a regular to the show on other subjects, but uh, I've had some uh, time to discuss things with Robert Lazar a couple of times because of the projects that I've worked on in the past that involved the same kind of jet engine that he used in that jet-powered car of his. And I wanted to know if Bob Lear or you, George, or anybody knows about his connection with Eugene Gluharif. Has anybody heard that name? Yes. Um, Eugene was the guy that made the little flying saucer. The little flying, oh, the little hovercraft. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, well, Gene is actually, uh, he was an uh, engineer from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and he's actually the guy who developed the jet engine that Bob used in that jet-powered car. What I'm trying to figure out and what I haven't been able to reconcile to this day is how somebody of the intelligence and the knowledge of Edward Teller would be attracted to that jet car to the point where it would qualify Bob to back-engineer alien craft. We're talking about a burner that runs on propane from the stuff you use in your barbecue. It's, these are not high-tech devices. As near as I can figure, what Bob came up with was a way to add an afterburner to that jet engine and make it create a little bit more thrust to push the car. Yeah, but that's not the... That wasn't the car that was in the story that Teller was reading. Teller was reading the the little uh, car that Bob had, and I forget whether it was a Toyota or, or I think it was a Honda. A Honda. Yeah, it was a hatchback. Right. Yeah, I I have uh, pictures of that that I got from Gene Glue Harris before he passed away, and it is that Glue Harris engine in there with some sort of a afterburner uh, unit in the back of the thing. Then he cut a hole out where the license plate would go, and that's where yeah. the jet thrust comes out. I don't think the I don't think it's the uh, technology of that that is what impressed Teller. It just happened to be a coincidence that on the day that he was visiting Los Alamos, that story about Bob was in the paper, and that was just more of an icebreaker than anything. I see. I, I can kind of see that too. Yeah, but uh, you know, uh, uh, Bob goes back with uh, Gene Glouhara for a long time. Uh, you can still find pictures of Bob in the old uh, jet catalogs, and this is stuff we used to get out of the back of Popular Science magazine. And Bob is sitting on a Schwinn banana seat bike with a little one of the jet engines on the back with a propane tank up under the bar in the front. And uh, what I always saw Bob to be was somebody that maybe even aspired to show business or, or barnstorming or crash and burners like we have in our business. And for some reason, he went in the other direction. Now, I'm, I'm of the same kind of bent, but I'm in the entertainment business. What I do is showmanship. Bob seemed to be a showman, and when you have intelligence and when you got too close to the actual subject, he would get very tight-lipped. For instance, he wouldn't give me any details on what he was doing to increase the thrust on the, uh, on the car. And then I look at the pictures, and I'm going, my God, that's just an afterburner. A few mathematical numbers. Anybody could build it. There was nothing really, really earth-shaking or anything that would qualify him to work on that kind of propulsion. Well, I, I would say that uh, I, I don't really recall Bob ever claiming that he had uh, re-engineered or made any kind of a propulsion breakthrough on the jet car. It was just happened to be some kind of an interest of his. But, uh, you know, John, maybe you can address no, that better than I could. No, I, that's all I remember. Hey, uh, Bill, thank you for the call. I appreciate it. We're going to have to take another short break. We'll be right back with more of your calls to John Lear. Welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. I'm George Knapp, your guest host, my guest tonight, John Lear, and we're taking your calls. We're going to go now to our first-time caller line, Rich in Citrus Heights, California. Rich, what's on your mind? Well, um, in uh, 1986, September, I think, <clears throat> I was going over the interstate in Nevada. I was about 20 miles from uh, the, the Nevada line, and uh, I, I pulled around this bend at a place called Blue Canyon, there was no cars on the road, pitch black, no moon, uh, a few stars. And uh, so right up as I turned the bend, there's this big, like, UFO flying saucer. I don't uh, – it didn't look like saucer shape. But I pulled over, and I walked up, started walking towards it, and uh, I could see the oscillating lights going around the exterior part of it. Um and it was like a yellowish orange light that four or five of them would just run around the perimeter of it. And, uh, then I, it didn't make any noise. There was no, no, no sound at all. And it was, uh, really quiet up there and no lights. And I was looking up and it started doing a different, uh, oscillation or, Something was different, so I turned to go back towards the car, and I looked, kept my eye on what was behind me there, and uh, this thing just sped off, just streaked off, and uh, it was gone, and it didn't make a sound. Did you have a question for John Lear? Yeah, I was wondering if if uh, that gravitational uh, um, thing. Uh, could have been as quiet enough 
door it doesn't make to me like it was yeah yeah, the the uh, the thing that described by Bob Lazar, I think, had no moving parts, did it, John? No. No. So it, it didn't make any noise. No noise. No. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks, Rich. We're now going to go to our wild card number one, Kurt in Washington D.C. Staying up pretty late tonight, Kurt. What's on your mind? Hey, good morning, gentlemen. How are you all doing? Um, my, my, it's a, I have a question, but let me preface it by saying I've, I had this vivid dream about two years ago, and needless to say, I'm interested in all this coast-to-coast type of program. I dreamt that I was on a secret mission working with the, directly with the vice president, current vice president, putting bugs in hotel rooms, and it was just a job. Nothing, nothing, no thought about it either way. And I woke up with the <laughs> the, the most odd feeling because um, I'm not a fan of the current administration. And I'm just wondering if you've heard any cases of people having those kinds of memories or thinking maybe that they have been pulled to do things and then erased just kind of so they don't remember them. I hear that all the time, but I don't know whether it's true or not. Okay. I've had some dreams about Heather Graham that I'm pretty sure didn't really happen. I'm just joking. <laughs> That's good. Thanks. Hey, George, say the number again. Coupon's trying to reach us. I'm going to give him a uh, number. There's a hotline number, 818-501-4725. That's for Gene Huff, 818-501-4725. We're going to go down to our wild card two line. Brennan in Phoenix, what's on your mind? Um, well, I had a two-part question. I'll ask you guys, and then I'll listen offline. Um, it seems to me like it's kind of ridiculous to think the government would hire someone like Bob Lazier to uh, be in a position like that, knowing that he, I mean, they would know that he's going to spill that information. What's he doing now? Where is he at now? And also, I had a uh, uncle that actually was a geological physicist at Area 51 for 21 years. With all the nuclear testing going on there, is it possible that the lights in the sky are from that. Thanks. John? Uh, Bob uh, runs unitednuclear.com uh, out of Sandia Park in New Mexico, sells scientific supplies, and I didn't hear the second question. He was asking about uh, whether or not the physics, uh, the, the uh, nuclear testing might have something to do with why people are seeing, uh, seeing uh, saucer-type things, lights in the sky at Area 51. I doubt that. They haven't done any of that testing in quite some time, uh, and uh, the, the descriptions that you see, uh, of, uh, that you hear of these craft out there certainly don't sound like anything that's generated by those kind of tests. Certainly what we've seen on film, on video, uh, certainly doesn't look like anything that was generated by a, a nuclear test, even though they, they've been gone for a lot of years. Right. Um, I think we have time for one more call before we take another break. How about uh, Wild Card 4, Lee in New York? Uh, yeah, hi. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm not familiar at all with uh, with Mr. Lear uh, and uh, his group, uh, but I, I've been listening to the show now, and I, I my complaint is that I don't really understand what is the point that he's trying to make. I mean, there's been a lot of, you know, folks. Yeah, you, you guys seem to know all the cast of characters that you're talking about, but we, the listeners, don't really know who they are, and you haven't really filled us in on them too well. And 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 what what is the thrust of this discussion? Is it that aliens somehow have taught um, our scientists uh, some secrets about anti gravitational um, <clears throat> material um, devices, and that that's what what is, has been being tested out at this place, Gruen Lake? Is that, is yeah, that the idea? yeah, I'd say that that was pretty much the central theme. And if you've missed that, then we've really done a, a really crummy job here There's tonight. A lot of folks, the anecdoting and talking about, you know, was it April 29th or April 30th, or you know, all these little details, the smoke screen of details, and it's it's just been hard to kind of get down to the basics of of what's being talked about here. And I I listen all the time, and so I, I'm fascinated by the subject. But I've you've kind of lost me. Well, ma'am, we apologize then if you if you missed that. Uh, if you're not familiar with Groom Lake in Area 51, I, I suppose maybe we have glossed over it a bit. But uh, the topic has been so well known for so many years and have been discussed on this program so many times. 
I think maybe we made the false assumption. I made the false assumption that that people had a basic understanding of the uh, the parameters of the story. And if you didn't get that, then I certainly would apologize for it. But I, I would have to say we've gone into quite a bit of detail about about uh, what's happened out there and why it's important. I mean, if you don't find it interesting that we have recovered alien technology and have been testing it in secrecy at a military base, uh, boy, I, I have really missed the mark. But I, I thank you for the call nonetheless. Uh, let's try to slip in one more call here before our break. Wildcard 3, Drew in Washington, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, guys. Hi. Hi. Um, well, I have a really simple question for you guys. Um, I'm just curious to know, is there any kind of statistics on how many sightings of UFOs there are? Not that I know of. Um, I think that most uh, sightings are of UFOs are sightings of our technology, s- stuff that, that belongs to the, the government. Uh, the ET stuff, I think, is pretty rare. <clears throat> Having said that, I believe the Chicago sighting was uh, ET. Think there the, uh, sti- are, Go ahead. Are there a number of ET sightings, though? Excuse me? Are there a fair number of ET sightings, or is it just... I mean, are there actually some ET sightings, or do you think it's mostly made up? No, no, there's a number of uh, ET sightings. I'm just saying that most of them are probably our own technology. Most ufologists will admit that probably 9 out of 10 uh, UFO reports or UFO sightings are explainable, prosaic items, planets, things that have clouds or, or terrestrial uh, vehicles. But it's also true that probably 9 out of every 10 UFOs that are seen are not reported at all. Gotcha. Okay. Can I just make a quick comment? Sure. You'd think for someone who has, like, a television and radio background, it wouldn't be nervous or nerve-wracking going on your show. You know, I still get pretty nervous. <laughs> no need to be nervous here. I appreciate you uh, giving us a call, and uh, thanks for listening. Okay, I think we're going to take uh, – have we got time for one more call before we go to the break? Okay, we don't have time. So, John, if you're going to stick around, we'll take a couple more calls. A lot of folks are on the lines waiting to talk to you. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. I need uh, five minutes for my hijack, uh, Blackbird hijack. Oh, okay. All right. Well, we'll do that when we come back. Uh, Stick around. I'm George Knapp. This is Coast to Coast AM. Thanks for hanging in there with us, everyone. We're back with John Lear uh, speaking about Area 51 and uh, Bob Lazar and all sorts of ufological topic topics. John, you had something else on your mind, though. We got a lot of people waiting to talk to you uh, on our, our phone lines, but you had something else on your mind you wanted to say. I'll make this very quick. It, concur- it concerns the uh, hijack of a blackbird by the um, um, Secretary of the Air Force, Michael Wynn, General Michael Hayden, who's the director of the CIA and uh, General Charles Metcalf, director of the Ma- National Museum of uh, Air Force. What happened is in 1990, the Air Force started to let all the uh, SR-71s and A-12s go to museums. The Minnesota Air Guard took one, an A-12, restored it for 13 years, put thousands of man hours uh, into it, and uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, got it all set, was on display at their museum, and last year, uh, the director of the CIA, Michael Hayden, Hayden, thinks he needs an SR-71 outside of his office there on a, on a post. So he gets uh, General uh, uh, Wynn and General Metcalf to, uh, to go to the Minnesota Air Guard with public money, take it down, take it to Omaha, get it ready for a pedestal, and to send it to the CIA. Uh, it's wrong. Uh, they, it's wrong that they did this. They're, uh, they're effectively taking, uh, uh, stuff that belongs to the public, and a, a bill called uh, uh, named uh, Senate Bill 437 has been introduced, and I'd just like anybody who's interested in righting a wrong to either uh, fax or email Carl Levin, who is the uh, head of the Chairman uh, Senate Arms uh, Committee and is holding this up, or your favorite congressman and senator, and say the simple message, send the Blackbird back to Minnesota. And that's all I had to say about that. Yeah, Jim Goodall worked his butt off to collect uh, all the parts and put that thing back into mint condition. Jim Goodall, of course, has written about blackbirds extensively. The A-12, of course, was the precursor to the SR-71, the, the greatest airplane that was ever built that we know about anyway, right? Right. Yeah. And, okay. Uh, and it, it, at CIA, uh, nobody will ever see it. You know, they put it on a, on a post, and it's wrong. It needs to go back to Minnesota. 
All right, so call your congressman folks out there. Uh, let's see. We're, we got a caller from, from Nevada here on our wild card line. Jerry in Nevada, what's on your mind? Yeah, so th- uh, thank you very much for taking my call. My question fits right in with your last statement. Uh, I have always been fascinated by the SR-71. I went, took my son to the uh, Ogden, Utah, took a look at uh, the museum over there and looked at that one real well. And uh, the guy that was giving the speech and the info on it, uh, at the end of it, he had a question and answer. And I asked him, I said, how fast does this thing actually fly? And he throws his chest out there and he said, well, we're authorized to say Mach 3 plus. And I looked at him. I said, well, I had it figured for about Mach 6. And that guy turned white as a sheet. And I would like to ask Mr. Lear, how fast does that thing go before it comes apart? Uh, it's not coming apart. It's limited by the inlet temperatures. And 332 uh, is the fastest I know that it's been flown. Three, uh, three, uh, 3.32. Oh, 3.32. Okay. And Gerald Greenemeyer was the guy that took it to that speed. And like I say, it's limited by inlet temperatures. This information is good for about 1974, 1975. If they improved it after that, I didn't know about it, and Daryl didn't know about it. Okay. Well, thank you so much for satisfying my curiosity. Okay. Th- thanks, Jerry. We're going to go now to uh, east of the Rockies line. Bob in Ohio, are you still there? Yes, I am. Uh, thanks, guys, for having the courage to talk about these things, so they uh, tend to get a little bit spooky. Uh, quick question for John, and then I'll uh, – uh, first of all, don't – wouldn't you think it's – I mean, it's obvious to me, and don't you think it's obvious, this is the first thing, that our plan is simply just has been hijacked. The things that are going on, the reason – I think the reason Lazar and you're able to still be drawing air is because a little bit of information, they can't just whack everybody on the planet in the head all at once. So feeding a little bit of information here and there and letting some of it out. and Obviously, whatever you know and a few people here and there know is su- such a small picture, a small piece of the puzzle. The big picture, and here's what I think, maybe you agree with part of it, the planet's been hijacked. There's so much going on. The chemtrails over where, in my area, are severe. The things have been proven. I have more gallons. This stuff is changing DNA. I believe vaccinations are fake, and they're changing DNA. And I think the overall picture is really radical. And all of, and most people are just, first of all, anybody that doesn't believe it is just wacky or just not informed. And we're just all... Most people are just having just getting by with their little world and having a war here and there, and those things are just drawing attention elsewhere. But the big picture doesn't look too good to me, and I'm actually afraid to even talk about it, but I did it for the first time. And uh, I will uh, check out uh, your website, too, John. I'm, I didn't even know about that, but I certainly agree with everything you've said. I've been abducted. I know I have for a fact. And I always know everything when I turn to a radio station like this. It's like, I've experienced all this. I already knew that. I don't know why I know it. All right. Thanks, Bob, for the thanks for the comments. John, any any comments uh, about chemtrails, contrails? He brought up some good points. I could give you a whole show on every one, each one of those subjects. What about the chemtrail part? Uh, the chemtrails is where they're releasing um, reflective material to uh, help uh, uh, um counter global warming no kidding so not poisons or no. or uh, medicines or anything no. like that uh-uh. okay uh thanks for the call uh, i think we've got time before we take our final break uh ron in san francisco on our west of the rockies line are you there i am um, what's yeah, on your mind my question's two part unfortunately i hope you have time to answer it um one i was uh lucky or <laughs> kind of strange to uh hear Bill, uh, William Cooper speak in 89 in a small UFO conference. He surely oh, was boy. passionate about the subject, but uh, how accurate do you think his uh, info regarding UFOs and underground bases uh, was, specifically Dulce? And also, the second part, kind of a funny thing, I just randomly opened his book. Is it true that uh, you told him that a certain retrovirus uh, was created to kill blood-sucking aliens? I don't think so. I, I, I never heard that one, but his information about Dulce was true. Hmm. And he seemed to think the Arculeta Mesa info was disinformation. No, that, that was true. 
All right, Bill, well, thank Bill. you so much. It's an honor to be on, and uh, thank you guys for your work. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the call. I, we probably should have got into Bill Cooper a little bit because uh, the, I think the first TV appearance he ever made was on a show that uh, that I produced back then with John Lear, and I'll never live that down, I suppose, because Bill Lear went on. I mean, uh, uh, Bill Cooper went on to uh, basically anybody that disagreed with him became a government disinformation agent. He was he would put out this paper about the the alien cover up, and he would kept saying over and over, "This is the final edition," and then just keep adding stuff to it over the years right, before he was we gunned. Gotta cover Bill Cooper. Yeah, we we will do that. Uh, I think we can probably try to squeeze one more in. Ron in Pioneer, California, on our first-time caller. Are you there? Hey, George and John, how you doing? Howdy. All right, gotta go. actually, you're just uh, talk about uh, Cooper there. That's a good segue here before you go. Um, I was reading a little bit more about that. I got his book, Behold the Pale Horse. Wanted to find out a little bit more about that. A couple questions. One, wanted to see actually uh, uh, if you guys could talk, expand a little bit more about two things, Project Excalibur, if that rings a bell. And also the Krill papers, John. I know that was a big thing between you and Mr. Cooper. Yeah, you know, what, what, you're, what happened was uh, the Krill papers were written by John Grace uh, in the summer of '88, and Bob Lazar wrote the Excalibur papers based on information that he got from Al, uh, Los Alamos. When Cooper and I were interviewed in my lim- living room by the, one of the TV video programs that were going on in those days, he starts talking about the Krill papers and. Um, Excalibur that he'd seen in the Navy. And uh, when we were done, I, I grabbed him and I took him in another room. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, what? And I said, Bob Lazar wrote the, the uh, Excalibur papers and, and John Grace wrote the Krill papers. He said, no, I saw those in the Navy. And that's when I realized that Bill Cooper had UFO disease. And UFO disease was when you run out of information, you're, you're so enthralled with the uh, with uh, the notoriety you're getting, you start to make it up. <laughs> and uh, that called into question pretty much everything that Bill Cooper wrote. That book, by the way, Behold a Pale Horse, I've heard it referred to as Behold a Pale of Horse. Yeah, that Hockey. was Larry Hansen's uh, <laughs> yeah. answer to Behold a Pale of Horse. That was great. Anyway, John, stick around, and you listeners at home, stick around. We're going to take our final break. We'll be back and try to squeeze as many calls as we can in for John Lear. This is uh, Coast to Coast AM, and I'm George Knapp. Welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. I'm George Knapp. We have a few minutes left with uh, our guest, John Lear. We're also joined, I think, on our wild card line by Gene Huff. Uh, Just in case you hadn't followed our earlier conversation, Gene was a friend of Bob Lazar's before Bob went to work at Area 51. He's the guy who introduced Lazar to John Lear, and he lived through many of the events that we've been discussing tonight. Gene, you there? I'm here. You're you're here up kind of late tonight. Any co- <laughs> Listen, that trick with giving me the phone number to call in on uh, live on the air worked really well. <laughs> I think they had a yeah. lot of big gene ups calling in. Yeah, probably so. Any comments on what you've heard so far? Uh, yeah, the guy that called about the, the, Bob and the jet engines and Eugene Gluhareff down there in uh, the Tri City area in California. I met Bob with Eugene Gluhareff, and the guy, you know, while he, he he's you know sets up his story about Bob and the jet engine and then gives us all of his uh, opinions on Bob Lazar and his personality. Uh, none of it, Nothing he said was true, though. Uh, Bob had a jet engine and a Honda Civic and then later a Honda CRX, and they were both real jet engines. That The jet he's talking about was a propane jet, which we put on a jet go-kart. And, uh, and in fact, for those of you that were at the last Desert Blast, Jim Taliani had it on his back, if I remember correctly, oh, with a pair of roller skates on blowing around. So the guy has that that story totally wrong okay well we're going to take a a call stick around gene maybe you can uh, chime in on this how about our wild card line jonathan and bakersfield are you there good morning good morning what's on your mind hi mike uh, before i ask my question about air 51 uh john lear you listening yeah love your jet hey thanks i i can't wait to get one i write motion pictures as a christian but before i got repented jesus name baptized and holy ghost filled i knew of a pastor who worked out at 51. They, we know this because while clinging through his car, we found one of the badges, and uh, he was kind of tight-lipped. But my question is, though I am repented, Jesus name baptized, Holy Ghost filled as a court Acts 238, and many Christians are, or whether you're Jew, Muslim, or whatever, how do you think the outcome of all this will be, whatever it be, vague as it is, when it hits the fan, so to speak, for all humanity concerned that is alive and among us before 
the good Lord returns. What's your, without being political, what's your feeling on that? Everything will be just fine. I mean, so like God being in control, of course, means we have to just have faith that he knows what he's doing. Because, you know, he deals on a need-to-know basis, too. You know, we don't know when he's going to return. And i got to tell you, uh, George, yes. you there? you got yes. a fantastic show. I love you and Mr. Nuri. I told him a UFO story I had just after getting the Holy Ghost. Something really creepy happened. But I know of, like, people, like I said, you still there? Yes. That uh, work out. There's this other man I know who I, whose name, obviously, I cannot give. And we went out to supper once. And this man in a coat, this long, long coat, Looked like he walked out a man in black, showed up, said, I have to talk to you right away, privately. And all I heard was three different things, 51 alien protagonists, and we got to move now. So he had to take me home quick, and they were gone. I didn't see him for weeks. So just so you know, if people are listening, there is more truth than even you're allowed respectfully to give that is truth. And I want to let you know that our Holy Jesus name prayers are with you and yours, because... You know, it's a great thing. It's to the glory of God to conceal matter, but to the glory of kings to search the matter out. And I and I want and I hope everybody keeps you in their prayers, because what you're doing is very bold. We live in a nation of indifference and a world of 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 nothing but lies. And for you to do this is very brave. And I want to let and, and please remember Acts two thirty eight. We love you all very much in your own our prayers, and I thank you. Okay. Okay, Jonathan, thank you very much. We're going to go to the West Coast line, Robert, in the San Joaquin Valley, which is my old stomping ground. <laughs> oh, is it really? Oh, yeah, Stockton, Modesto, Sacramento, sure. Well, it's a pleasure to speak to you, sir. And John? Yeah. This is Robert again. I've talked to you on our show a few times. Yeah. And your whole family, uh, going back with Bill, building the lair. i got all kinds of photographs and things, and... Uh, things that we've talked about, uh, Sam Old, John Heiser, yep. a lot of others, you know, people you and I know. One of these days, i got to get together with you. Okay. You living out of Vegas? Yep. Yeah. How's your gold mine going? We're doing fine. Okay. Well, I look forward to seeing you. And I have one question I'd like to bring up for the listeners with all that's uh, happening nowadays uh, with these new developments with uh, planes, have you uh, been witnesses, or can you even talk about it, the unmanned planes? And I'll cut it off there, and it's a pleasure to talk to you again. Thank you. What do you say, George? He wants to know if you've seen any of these unmanned planes, which uh, I can answer that for you a little bit. Uh, we have a base called Creech, which used to be known as Indian Springs, just outside of Las Vegas, and you can go sit on the freeway and watch them every day. It's yeah, like the, the number one place where they test them. Uh, so, yeah, that I think probably all of us, everyone who lives here has seen them uh, once or twice. Uh, I'm going to go to Hector in New York on our first-time caller uh, line. Hector, are you there? Uh, yes. Um, What's on I your have... mind? Can you hear me good? Yeah, go ahead. All right, I have a question about the uh, validity to the claims about um, the reptiloids and how like they have to do with the Dulce Mountains areas and the conflict with the greys. And cooperation between, like, um, you know, the government and things like that. So a quick second question would be uh, about, like, the psychic defenses they have there. Like, can you infiltrate them with uh, remote viewing or, uh, like, astral projection? Okay, let me wow. ask the first one, uh, remote viewing and astral projection. I don't know whether you can penetrate Dulce or not. It seems to me you would be able to, but uh, I studied remote viewing, and, and it's uh, it's real. Uh, even a dummy like me can do it. Um the first question I didn't hear, George, did you? Something about reptoids. Uh, Gene, did you hear uh, that one? He wants to know how the reptoids no, fit with No, that. I didn't hear I, it. I have a question for John. I'd like to know when the guy who thought the Holy Ghost prompted him to call this show wanted to know what would happen when they released the information. John, why did you say everything will be fine when you think that if men find out that they're not as high on the food chain as they thought they were, that everyone will be pretty nervous about that fact? Why did you let that guy slide? Um. I think everything's going to be fine. <laughs> okay, good enough. <laughs> uh, do we have uh, Floyd in San Antonio on the wild card line? Floyd, you there? Yeah, yes. Uh, John Lear, uh, a show or two back, mentioned that he got a, a several-hour tour of the Dulce, New Mexico area by the local sheriff or uh, policeman there. I just, he didn't tell a whole bunch about it. Could you just give some details of, of, of what happened during that tour? 
Well, what what happened is uh, Gabe Valdez, who was the uh, head of the highway patrol there in Dulce, uh, when I went there to, to check things out, I called him up because I'd heard his name, and he said, uh, I know you, John, and, and this was like in 1989. I said, you know me? And he said, yeah. Remember back in uh, 1972, you brought in, you uh, flew in a Learjet here, and you had some stakes for Dean Martin. Uh, who was filming a movie here, and you brought in his girlfriend. And I said, I'll be darned, I remember that. And he said, yeah, I was the one that met the airplane. And so I had known him from 20 years before. Anyway, I went on an eight-hour shift with him and talked about Dulcy and uh, and all that, that happened around there. There wasn't anything specific. It was that, yes, Dulcy existed. Yes, the locals knew about it. No, they weren't going to tell anybody else about it, and more or less that type of stuff. Does that answer your question? Uh, well, yes. I just thought maybe John had actually seen something that night. Was <laughs> what I was wondering about. So, no, I didn't see anything that night. By the way, George, I hate to interrupt, but I wanted to tell you I am sitting here with Bob Lazar's day-to-day wall calendar diary from late 1988 and early 1989. So I have all of the entries, and I just wanted to, uh, John mentioned some of the dates before, and the first time he went out to uh, S4. His calendar entry says trip to nowhere. And uh, on April 6, 1989, it says debrief, 